Steve is on the meeting. Okay, so we didn't get that on recording. The last comment. Um, all right. I can repeat it if you want. <laughs> if there's yeah, time. can you repeat it? Sure. Just real quick. Just sure, real quick. sure. So um, Avenue 34 update. In early October, uh, DTSC asked the developers to submit a plan for offsite testing, including the possibility of testing buildings. Um, that's a good thing, and it's something we've been asking DTSC to do for more than a year now. Um, but the developer submitted a plan that only included a very few sampling locations. DTSC rejected that plan and said they had one week to do one with more sampling locations and indoor testing. The developers are refusing to do that. They've more than a month passed their deadline. And um, uh, we also learned that the developers got a building permit from the city in October, even though DTSC hasn't signed any sort of letters saying that their cleanup is done. And um, even though they're currently asking the developers to do more testing. Um, and we feel that now that the developers have their permit, they probably don't feel an incentive to go along with DTSC's demands. Um, and on site, we're watching the developers excavate huge holes, sift that soil, then use that soil to fill in other areas of excavation on the same day. This would seem to violate DTSC's cleanup plan. Uh, the cleanup plan requires lab testing of all soil before it's used or redistributed on site and lab testing of all excavated areas before they can be filled in. And since they're doing all these activities on the same day, and there would be like a, a 24 hour lag time for each of those steps to, to go out to a lab and come back, we suspect that this testing isn't even happening. We've asked DTSC for the test results and they haven't given us any for like the past months. So that just confirms our suspicions that this cleanup is not going according to plan. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, community, for you know, that, this important statement that Michael made, and we have it on record here with the recording. All right. Any other community members have a, a comment to make that, that's about something that's not on the agenda? Please raise your hand or press star nine. You have a, one minute to speak. I do not see any hands raised. All right. So then we're going to move on to three community and board announcements. Uh, so are there any community members with any announcements for the community and for the board? Uh, you have one minute. Please raise your hand or press star nine. It could be like, come to my birthday party or, you know, I want to announce this thing. Press uh, star nine or raise your hand. I see two hands raised on the attendee side. Sure. Vanessa Leva, you have one minute to speak. Um, hello, um, my name is Vanessa Leva and I'm the new director at Lincoln Heights uh, Recreation Center. And I just wanted to introduce myself very quickly and um, invite you guys to our uh, winter holiday event. Uh, that's December 17th um, and it'll be from 11 to two. And I'm gonna be reaching out to see if you guys would like to help us out or support us in any way. Um, we are trying to uh, get gifts for toy giveaway, um, uh, light refreshments, crafts, and edible art. And um, we are also trying to raise money to have a Mickey and a Minnie there distribute the gifts. So um, that's about it. But um, I look forward to uh, meeting you guys and seeing you guys there. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vanessa. Next, we have Steve Caston. Hi, Steve. Everybody, hi Sarah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to give a little information on the Chamber of Commerce and the Biz Improvement District. Um, it's on your agenda. I want to let you know our stand on the building on the city parking lot behind Bank America. Um, we've sent a letter from the bid opposing it because they're not providing parking. They're taking all the parking for the housing development, so we opposed it. It'll be on the chamber's agenda. I don't know what the motion will be, but it'll be on the chamber's agenda. And then there is a petition that I believe is going to go around the community. The Bank of America employees didn't even know that this was happening. And we heard from some of them, they said they use the lot to park when they go to work. So I think it's an ill-conceived ill plan to not provide parking, that they have the ability to build it without providing any more parking. And that's what they've told us. 
So I just want you to know the stand from the Biz Improvement District and probably the Chamber of Commerce and the petition going around the community. So that's my input for tonight's meeting. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Steve, what's okay. the website for the, um, if somebody wanted to see the agenda for the uh, meeting for the Chamber of Commerce, do you guys have a website or would it be the bid? Um, the bid already had their meeting. I'll send you the information on the chamber. So um, we also, anybody's invited and we're going to have a little celebration for the holidays at the board meeting. So we'll send you the information. You're all, everybody's invited. Hopefully you'll participate. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Steve. Next, we have Matthew Noah Lopez. Hello, everyone. Good evening, Neighborhood Council. Thank you for allowing me to take the time to be here tonight. My name is Matthew Noah Lopez. I am the teaching artist with the Department of Cultural Affairs of Los Angeles at the Lincoln Heights Youth Arts Center. I'm here with my colleague, Luz Rodriguez, who is the arts education manager at the center. We're here on my director's Angelica uh, Lau Perez's behalf that couldn't be here tonight to just inform the community about the tree lighting ceremony hosted by the Lincoln Heights Farmers Market that will take place this Saturday, December 3rd at Del Angel Mortuary, which is located on the corner of North Broadway and Sitchell Street. This is a free event for the entire community, including the neighborhood council. It will include free toys, food, crafts, and free pictures at Santa. It, we, the Lincoln, <laughs> We, the Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center, will be hosting a holiday caroling sing-along during the tree lighting event. We invite everybody to join us in a singing and singing some holiday classics. Children who participate will receive one voucher for a free toy. We hope to see you and all your families celebrating with us. Thank you. Matthew, quick question. What time is that? That is from 3 p.m or excuse me, 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh Thank you, I don't see any other hands raised. Board member had announcements, um, one minute each, just uh, if you guys have any quick announcements, be, be mindful we have a sort of long agenda here. Sylvia? Hi, Hello. Sylvia Lara yep. here. Okay. Uh, very quickly, uh, this Saturday, uh, join us for the Los Angeles uh, Tenants Union People's Assembly on the housing crisis. Uh, listen to the voices of tenants. We're the ones leading the fight in the city and our communities. Come out to hear reports from our local leaders and participate in the discussion about tenants' demands moving forward. That is at LA City College, and that's going to happen on December 3rd, uh, 12 to 5 p.m. All right, thank you, Sylvia. Okay, any other board member announcements? Um, I have an announcement uh, on Saturday, December 10th, there is a breakfast with Santa at uh, Hazard Park Recreation Center. Uh, Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council is part of it. Uh, so the breakfast with Santa, it's free to all community, all ages, all, Lincoln, all of Lincoln Heights, it's, uh, it begins at 9.30 a.m. and it ends at, at uh, 11 a.m., the breakfast with Santa Park. And then there's a toy giveaway. It, it begins at noon and it's uh, free toys, free gifts for uh, those between the ages of one and 17 years old. And uh, Hazard Rec is on Norfolk and Soto there at Hazard Park, Saturday, December 10th. All right, and that's the announcement. Um, now, Vince, I have a couple. Vince, are you on here? Yes, I am. Oh, I have one more announcement. So uh, LA just Department of City Planning has a corn, Cornfield Arroyo Seco specific plan, a CASP update, pre preliminary draft virtual open house Wednesday, December 7th at 6 p.m. So on our agenda, we have the link to the Zoom info. And the CASP is the whole area on the other side of the five freeway where St. Vincent's is and the jail all the way down to Lanza Bros. So um, that's the whole area that has been rezoned for a new um, specific plan, right? So we wanna weigh in on that. All right, Vince, so there's A, a and B on here. Do you wanna run over those real quick? 
on the agenda. That's the uh, update. MPGs and the uh, William Mead. And the William Mead, can you just do it pretty, just give a nice brief right. one? So MPG applications, you have up until uh, December the 9th. We are scheduled to hold a meeting on for the budget. And this is only to discuss um, what we have in the budget for the MPGs that we will be hearing in our next general board meeting. And that is scheduled, give me one second for my agenda. That will be scheduled for December the uh, 9th. So please have them in. Even if you don't have it in, we can still hear the, the grant for our XCOM and then our general board. But if anybody has any questions or information that they need for the uh, MPG, you can be at the, the budget meeting on December the 9th. Okay, and then uh, as far as the update for William Mead, I attended the William Mead um, uh, housing project uh, event that they had with the community. And I just have to say this about it. Everything was pre-planned before any of the people had an opinion, a comment or anything. And this was all done by, by um, the LA Housing Authority. Um, I didn't like that I heard a lot of coaching from city officials on what they should want in their neighborhood. The environment was very controlling that people were given a box of um, Legos and they were told to envision um, their neighborhood, but they had to use all the Legos. And so there were actual people that said, hey, this is too big. Like we're, we don't have anywhere else to stack these Legos. And they kept saying, well, go higher and put a bridge. And I mean, and these things were like enormous, right? And I thought that was, I've seen this before because they do it in almost every city program where they bring three options up that have already been discussed on what the plans are. So this is not really a public engagement, but more of pushing these three concepts that they came up with before the public had any input on them. And so I did bring it up to the uh, project manager um, and told them that this was very unfair. Um, I also heard people wanting to talk about the contamination that's, that's on the land. And they were told, not now, not now, not now. This is not what we're working on. And another comment I heard too was, um, we don't wanna play with Legos because it doesn't represent truly what's happening and what we want in our neighborhood. So. To me, those comments were the most important out of all the other ones. And I, I really think that people need to engage because that project is forming what housing is going to be in the next like 20, 30 years on what they're actually doing with the land like um, William Mead that is real, truly public housing. This is not a public-private partnership. This is real, true public housing. This is the type of housing we're going to need to secure it into the future because the other type of housing, which is the PPP, uh, a public-private partnership, those have 50-year sunset clauses in them that after 55 years, we don't know what's going to happen with it. We do know what happened to the 30-year clause. That's They're all coming up now. We're losing all the housing. So we're kicking the can twice as far down the road for not only your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren to deal with. So... This is definitely a real important meeting to attend next time if anybody can make it. And I plan, because me and Sarah are the two appointed people as representatives. I yeah. encourage people to attend it, please. I want to I want to tell everybody, yeah, HACLA assembled an advisory board for the redevelopment of William Mead. And we had to kind of push to get uh, seats on that. And so there are uh, community stakeholder seats on that board. So we encourage the community. Now, if you want to be on this advisory council, email us. And then also, uh, Vince, do you want to handle this strictly through uh, environmental justice committee? Because people can um, join the committee and then. Correct. Yeah, they can come through, through the committee or email me at uh, it's a Vincent M dot H. L H N C at gmail.com. Sorry about that. All right. Thank, thank you, Vince. All right. So any other board member announcements? No? Okay. We're going to run quick here. Okay. So government reports, one minute per person, government officials. Uh, I hope that's not, uh, we could do, uh, 
I think I promised Lene two minutes, so uh, two minutes each. And if it's a thing sh strictly for board members, like if it could be emailed to our board, if it's something that the community doesn't really have any interest in, like uh, please uh, just send it to the board. If it's for our functioning purposes. Um, so uh, Lene, is Lene on the horn here? Okay, so we'll go to, okay, so, uh, okay, wait, but, but Lene's here. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm taking your job, Bernie. <laughs> Lene, you have two minutes to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate you giving me this time to address your board. Um, my name is Lene Basulto, and I'm your election administrator with the Office of the City Clerk. And I want to give you a little bit of updates on the upcoming uh, Neighborhood Council elections. We Our budget was approved so that we can conduct uh, what we refer to as hybrid election models, uh, which provides traditional in-person voting along with the option to vote by mail for every neighborhood council. So we're hoping that this model provides the flexibility not only for stakeholders to vote at a polling place or by mail, ensuring maximum participation. Um, we're currently preparing and some, one of the first regions are now open for candidate filing. Um, we have updated our website and we may, uh, to help make finding candidate and voter resources easier as well as uh, redesign to a more mobile, digital friendly format. Um, you can visit our website at clerk.lacity.org forward slash NC elections to see more resources and election related materials. Um, thank you so much for the board. We did receive your election information worksheet and we are using that in order to um, secure your polling hours and your language requests where you have Spanish and Chinese and recruit to our first uh, choice polling place. Um, once we have a polling place recruited, I definitely will be sending the board a confirmation email to let you know that we've secured your polling place. Um, we've had multiple requests to change the order of the election. So this year you'll notice the elections, um, you're still part of Region 8, however, the election schedule is different. Um, NCs that went last um, last election cycle are now going first. So you're part of Region 8 and your election date is Saturday, May the 20th in 2023. Um, your candidate filing period will still remain at 45 days. It begins on Friday, January the 20th and ends on Monday, March the 6th. Um, candidates will be able to submit an application using an online portal or a paper application. The portal will be available and accessible to candidates 24 seven during the application period. Um, our office will our cur is currently right now working on some educational materials and instructional videos to assist stakeholders when filing their candidate applications. Um, in 2021, the filing deadlines were at 5 p.m. and we had some um, requests from NCs about extending the deadline hours. And we heard you and we listened and our office will now be moving candidate and voter deadlines to 11.59 p.m. to give you a little bit more time. Um, however, staff will still only be available during regular office hours to assist candidates and voters. So we really encourage you not to wait till the last minute, but know that you do have that little extra time uh, to get your applications in. Let me talk a little bit about the hybrid model. Um, stakeholders have one of two options to vote in the NC election. Um, they can vote by mail. So stakeholders may request a ballot using our online vote by mail portal to complete a paper application starting 60 days prior to the election day. That means your vote by mail period would begin on Tuesday, March the 21st, and it would end on Monday, May the 1st. Um, the portal will be accessible to stakeholders 24 seven during the application period as well. Our office will review each application to verify that the stakeholder meets the NC's requirements to receive a ballot and we will begin mailing ballots 35 days prior to election day. Vote by mail ballots can be returned by mail but must be postmarked by election day, which once again is May the 20th and received by our office up to 10 days after the election has occurred. Anyone unable to submit a vote by mail application who does not receive their ballot by election day will have the option to vote in person at a polling place. And just to reiterate on uh, your election information form, you ask for the hours of 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. 
and you are asking as your first choice to be the Lincoln Heights Senior Citizen Center on Workman Street. So we are currently trying to secure that for you. Um, election staff will work as poll workers and administer voting on election day and a roster of stakeholders who voted by mail will be at each polling location to prevent any type of double voting. Um, the county owned ballot drop boxes will not be utilized in 2023 because stakeholders do have the option now to turn their ballots in on election day and there is 10 extra days to get those ballots if they send them by mail and the postage is prepaid by us on the envelopes to return vote by mail ballots so they can drop them in the mail and there's 10 days after the election day for us to receive them in order for them to count as long as they're postmarked by election day. Um, let me talk a little bit just about the COVID requirements. Um, we understand that things are changing and it's it's you know constantly moving, but currently we're using what the current city policy is, which is proof of vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test within the past 72 hours will be required to enter a polling place. Any voter who cannot provide these required COVID documents will be able to vote. However, we will have a system outside. So we're not turning anybody away. What we are doing is changing the way that we'll assist them, kind of like curbside voting, um, we'll make uh, um, accommodations to make sure that they get a chance to vote. Uh, maps are strongly recommended, but are not required to enter polling place. So just keep in mind, if things change, we will make sure to change our policies accordingly, notify the board, make sure it's posted at the web, I mean, on their website and at the polling place so everybody is aware, but nobody will be turned away. Um, Post election day, our office will begin tallying ballots the next business day uh, following the election, which can be observed in person or via online streaming. Unofficial results will be released approximately five days after the election. Official election results will re be released approximately 13 days after the election. I know there's a lot to talk about, but um, I just wanted to give you this information that relates to your board. If you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call, Sarah. I emailed you, you obviously have my email. Feel free to share it with the board. I'm here to help you. So, um, and prior to the election, I will be sending you the board, your ballot voting model, kind of give you an idea of the, the races that we see on the ballots to give you an idea uh, so that you have a chance to review it and take a look at it, just to make sure that it is in line with what your bylaws is are requiring this time. And obviously, um, Jose from Empower LA would be the one that would talk about the outreach and other uh, things that deal with that. But this is just my part. So if you have any questions, I'm here. Okay, thank you, Anne. Yeah, we just so the public knows, we have uh, 12 seats up for election 2023. So uh, if you're interested in being on the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council, you can go to- uh, Let me give you the office number. It's 213-978. 0444. Any uh, stakeholder that has questions, please feel free to call the office. Staff is available to help you on how to ha handle uh, filling out applications. Any questions, our staff is ready and willing to help. Well, thank you, Lene. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lene. Next, we have Battalion 6. Nine six LAFD. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> I had like triple mute on. I'm sorry. Um, I'm actually Battalion Two uh, in the um, in uh, Eagle Rock. I cover your area. Uh, my name's Daniel Curry. I'm working tonight, and uh, just wanted to talk to you quickly about uh, our Spark of Love Holiday Toy Drive. If you bring a new unwrapped toy or sporting good to any neighborhood fire station, um, you can do that. Or even a local Subaru retailer now will also accept those toys. Uh, there's also a couple of additional ways you can help out. Uh, if you wish to just make a credit card donation, you can actually text the word SPARK to 24365, 24365. And uh, that will uh, allow you to make a secure credit card donation and which will allow us to uh, buy the toys directly instead of uh, wait for them to be donated. Or if you wish to donate by mail, you can make a check payable to the nonprofit 
LAFD Foundation, and you write Spark of Love on the memo line. And the mailing address for that is LAFD Foundation 1700 Stadium Way, number 100, Los Angeles 90012. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I do not see any other hands raised. All right, no more hands raised. So we're going to move on to the next item now. So, uh, Vince, do we have an MER for October? No, they didn't generate it for October yet. So since we have a sort of action-packed agenda today, I think I might um, table some or continue some items to the next meeting, which will be December 15th. And I'm going to say what those items are right now. I'm going to continue item number uh, 5A, the minutes. I'm going to continue number 6A to the next meeting. Um, is uh, Roy here on here? No, Roy. Okay, so I'm going to continue number. Seven A to the next meeting. That's the Paradise Hill. Then, um, and then Vince for seven B for the Environmental Justice Committee. We'll um, see if there's a time at the end of the meeting to continue that item. It's a letter. Okay. Okay, so now we'll move on to, uh, okay, uh, so we skipped funding items. Now we're going to item number, what is that? Six, Executive Committee B, announcement of LHNC vacancies. So every meeting I have to announce this, and I'm announcing to the community here, these are our current vacancies. If you want to fill a vacancy, uh, Go to lhncs.carrd.co where it has the application. And you can send it to Secretary Sanchez. All the information is on there. All right, so I'm here, I'm here by announcing the vacancies. Okay, so we have a youth rep vacancy. That's a youth rep from a high school, right? If you want to be on this and get extra credit for your college or whatever, join the NC. Youth rep, business rep, another business rep, ending 2023. CBO, community-based org rep, 2025. Another CBO, community-based org, org rep, 2023. That's if you're associated with a community-based organization in Lincoln. Okay, so uh, as far as area rep seats go, we have an area three rep resident seat ending in 2023, area four representative at large, 2025, area four rep resident ending in 2023, area six rep resident ending in 2023, just so everybody knows, Area 3 is the area around Lincoln Park, going north to Broadway. Area 4 is down near USC, all the way to Soto and uh, to the Jack in the Box. And um, Area 6 is where the brewery is, south of Lanza Bros. So the applications there on our, our uh, agenda there, or on our Lincoln Bay. So uh, 6 1 6 a 6 b 1 discussion possible action to appoint stakeholders to the following vacancies now we have some uh, applications for vacancies correct Fernanda do you want to run with this sure okay. um we received two completed applications one from Christina Cabrera for CBO and the other from Angelo Balamo for business rep Okay, and then uh, so the protocol is the uh, applicant introduces themselves for two minutes. We just kind of have to be strict with our time. So the applicants are going to introduce introduce themselves to the board and to the community, and then we're going to have a community the a community Q and A, and then a board member Q and A, and then we're going to vote to fill these vacancies. So uh, I'm going to run the timer here. So uh, yeah, sorry I took over again. <laughs> So we'll proceed with uh, whoever Bernie chooses. Um, Angela and Christina, if you could both raise your hands um, so that I can promote both of you. Um, we're going to start with Angelo. His application was received first. Hey, I'm going to promote you to panelist so you can go ahead and give a statement. Um, introduce yourself. Uh, and also include the position you're applying for and why you would like for that position. 
And then Angelo, you can choose to be on video or not. So I'm gonna run the timer here. <laughs> Angelo? We can elevate Christina too. Oh, she's already. Angela, you've been promoted. Okay. Okay, I've unmuted. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yeah, Angela, yeah. hey. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I um I was uh applying for business rep and uh I think I'd be good as a business rep because I understand what I understand what uh, it means to live in this neighborhood um, and as a renter um, and uh, also as what it, what it means to work in this neighborhood and uh, as a business owner and a worker. And uh, I think, I think those uh, features qualify me um, as a business rep with this neighborhood. Thank you, Angela. And uh, so, uh, let me think. Um, business rep, yeah. So you have your own business. I don't want to. If you want to keep talking, you have another minute to talk. Well, so. I, I've submitted. Uh, I've submitted some. I read, went ahead and resent some of the proof of stakeholdership. Oh, no, uh, those are... It's it's really up to the community. So the community is going to kind of like have some questions for you so if the, you know if there's anything beyond just the basic criteria for qualification like if there's any you know do you want to make it like a statement about like goals or like future of Lincoln Heights or uh you know pr preservation or uh what are your business what you do yeah with? well I mean to me uh preservation is something that's important for the neighborhood we're talking about the neighborhood's history I feel like the uh, the goal of um, preserving a neighborhood's history is not only is it not uh, at odds with the per the imperatives of renters, uh, but I think that it's they go hand in hand. As as you know, oftentimes the uh, buildings with red targets on them from developers usually tend to be older buildings. They all spoke because they're the rent control buildings, right? So, so those are the ones that uh, someone who's looking, usually a non-resident owner is looking to get rid of, it would be a building that's um, rent controlled by statute. And that would be our housing stock that's pre-1978, which is all historic now. Um, 1978 might not seem, or maybe it's 74. Doesn't seem that long ago to us, uh, some of us, but uh, it is now. <laughs> And uh, the Department of the Interior considers buildings around that age, even that, even as young as from the 70s, to be historic, uh, which makes some of us feel pretty old. But um, but those are all um, any any that are more than one unit are considered rent control, um, and that's why we need to work extra hard to protect that housing stock because it's. It's not, I mean, rent control is, is this really, unfortunately, it's the strongest guarantor we have for affordable housing for uh, renters and workers in this, in this neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, that's, um, I've been working in preservation, historic preservation, getting, uh, getting nominations for buildings to protect them from the wrecking ball. Um, you know, there's only so much you can do. It, it, ultimately, it's things, as you know, things are so bad in this neighborhood, well, in this city, that oftentimes developers will just knock a building down, even if it is historic, you know, devil may care, and maybe maybe they get a slap on the wrist or something, but we, we still have to try, and that's what I do. Uh, most of the rest of my time is spent performing the work of actually restoring the buildings. That's most of what my business is centered around, is fixing the old buildings in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods around here. All right, thank you, Angelo. That was a very good uh, comment. Okay. okay, so now we're gonna go to comment. Uh, board member, should we go to board member or community? We go to community first. So if anyone in the community has a comment for Angelo or a question you would like to ask, now would be the time to do that. Um, so please raise your hand. 
yeah, one minute, please. Um, so Angela is applying as a business rep on the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council for vacancy. I see one hand raised, Christina. Um, I'm unsure if that's for a question right now. All right, hand was put down. I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so we move on to board question or comments. If you have any questions for our applicant, Angelo, please raise your hand. Um, well, point of, point of order or comment. We've yeah. got two positions. I recommend that we fill the uh, term that expires in 2023 um, because uh, we'll be frozen from filling that shortly. Well, we have a 2025 and a 2023. Uh, so if we fill this 2023, we could still fill the 2025. Okay. And in a few weeks, we will no longer be able to fill the 2023 because we'll to be too applicant. close to elections. I think it's up to the applicant what seat they want. So, um, you know, with their schedule. It, it's the same seat. Um, I second what Ben says. Okay. Uh, any other uh, board questions? It's, all, it's uh, up to me at all. I do prefer 2023. Okay, 2023. All right. Any questions for Angela? Yes, we have Sylvia. Oh, hello. Hi, uh, Angela, I really appreciate your passion for um, preserving the history of Lincoln Heights um, and building specifically. That's great. But I'm my concern is um, as a business owner, what actions are you taking to support the community specifically? Is there anything like paid internships with uh, people that are interested, students that are interested in, in, in engaging in like business, business administration at a later point. Um, I'm concerned, not concerned necessarily, but I'm just wondering other than the preservation of buildings, what is it that your business is doing to help support people? Well, preserving buildings is supporting people in this neighborhood. Directly. But uh, directly, I also do free work on the building, on the apartments of people who can't get the landlord to do it. Uh, even in my complex here, there's um, there's an awful lot of repairs that need to be done in order to make it. And this ranges from plumbing work. Um, my next door neighbor has to empty buckets because his plumbing is backed up and he can't get the landlord to do anything about it. Uh, so from time to time, I will do, I will clear his pipes and I'll put all this back together under his sink and uh, clear clear all this, the drains out so that he actually has a full bathroom and kitchen, um, which he doesn't uh, sometimes. And it's just a, a recurring problem with the plumbing here. Um, I've replaced several windows in this apartment complex, but it's not just um, this apartment complex where I've done this sort of work. Uh, I, I do it whenever I get the chance. And um, that's that's really how I've done it. As far as taking on interns um i haven't had a chance to do that yet but that's a sounds like a really good idea and i mean i would love to take on take on some interns and train them because we fact of the matter is we need more people trained in in um in this kind of work and uh I, i'd love to be a part of that sure thank you sylvia next we have richard Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, I would like to ask, what are some of your favorite businesses around Lincoln Heights or spots that you wanna like they that you like? You know what I mean? Uh yeah. Yeah, Lincoln Heights. Um I I um for obvious reasons like Heritage Square. Um, um that, that's like nice. Oh, that is right. I forgot. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I mean, if you if you start quizzing me on exactly what the boundaries of Lincoln Heights are, I might be in trouble. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I I think they are. Um, I hope they are, because uh, that's where I pr I present my evidence for stakeholdership comes from work I did for them. Um. Uh, there's um, 
need to think about some, I guess, uh, Lichas, Pancho Lopez, Raspa does not yet eat. Uh, these are, you know, there's plenty of great establishments in this in this neighborhood. Um, I don't really patronize them as a business owner. That's more of in my capacity as a resident. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, as a business owner here, I do like to support fellow business owners here. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, just a, a little time reminder here, it's almost 7 p.m. So uh, if board members could just kind of limit their questions here for, you know, <coughs> that has to do with the actual position and stuff, um, because we have one more applicant and then we're gonna get to the land use items here. Um, That's fine. Last we have Annalie. Um, I was going to ask how long you have been a resident and, and, um, and then also where you live before that. I mean, maybe you've lived here for a very, very long time, which it doesn't really matter, but I'm just, anyways. Yeah. I moved here from Cypress Park, uh, over a year ago, um, to find the exact month I, I could do my lease. Um, and, uh, no, yeah, that's, that's how long I've been living in this neighborhood. Of course, I've been working in this neighborhood longer uh, as the submitted proof will, will show. Um, I can provide more, more proof of having um, operated in this neighborhood if needed. I mean, I mean, I'd be, I'd, whatever. I was just, I was just wondering, kind of just to like get a history, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like, hey, I lived in this area and then da, 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 whatever, whatever, anyways, that's all. But uh, yeah, anyways. You know, kind of like, like, uh, like, I mean, I did it before I, I was on the board. I didn't live in Lincoln Heights very long, but I lived in like different areas and like seeing, Usually, you know, gentry. We don't have a lot yeah. of time here. Okay, so we got Okay, sorry. All right, never mind. All right, bye. I'm done. Not to be an old jerk. All right. So, uh, any other board member questions for uh, Angela? And just so everybody knows, East Los Angeles used to go up to the Pueblo boundaries to the north, which now right. encompasses. I don't see any other hands raised um, oh, from right. people members. So um, no hands raised from the community. Uh, so I motion to accept his application. Is I'll second. Seconded by Ben. Any board discussion? I don't see any hands raised. Um, Richard, is your hand raised? Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So no hands raised. We're going to go ahead and move this to a vote. Um, the motion is to accept Angelo's application for business representative ending in 2023. A yes vote is to approve his application. A no vote would be to reject his application. Oh, Fernanda. Yes. Can you guys hear her? I'm sorry? Yeah, I can hear her. Yep. Cool. Okay, I'm going to move forward with the vote. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Yes. I pressed a weird button. Okay, so, okay. yes. So we are voting on Angelo Belomo's application for business representative seat. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Yes. Chente? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Nancy is excused. Benny? Yes. Annalie? Annalie? Okay, we'll go back to Annalie. Go back to Annalie. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? I think I have to recuse. Yes. Right, George. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's fine. Uh, for, I believe recusals are for like financial interest. Oh. Also for future reference for recusals that does have to be done at the very beginning of the item. My bad, I'm sorry. Uh, well then yes, if I'm allowed to vote on this Chris, one. Can we just do a majority vote on the, the applicants? We're almost done, Sarah. Did you? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? 
Gil Arevalo. I'll go back to Gil. Richard. Hello. Steve. Yes. Selena. I'm sorry, I was muted. My vote is yes. I was muted. Sorry. Gil, yes. Selena. Yes. Esmeralda. Yes. Back to Anna Lee. Anna Lee Hall. That is still uh, 14 yeses, and Anna Lee is not here. Motion Do carries. Do you have quorum? Motion carries. Congratulations, Angela. We're going to hurry and send you the onboarding email. Look forward to serving. All right, thank you. Thank you for applying, Angela. Okay, so next we have Sylvia's hand raised. Um, hi, Angela, welcome. I would love to see your update on the internships just because I do believe it's important for businesses in this area not to just see Lincoln Heights as a way to grow their business, but also to grow the community. Welcome on board. A living wage, uh, so spread the word. Uh, 20, 25 an hour, depending on experience, 20 an hour, for the uh, happy to take people to train. Um, so send them my way, absolutely, and I'll be looking. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to both of you. The next application we have is for community-based organization from Cristina Cabrera. If you can go ahead and raise your hand so I can promote you to panelist. All right, Cristina. So you have a moment to introduce yourself, mention the position you are applying for, um, what community-based organization are you applying on behalf of? And then we'll go ahead and move on to questions from the community and the board. Can you guys hear me? Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. Hey guys, I'm um, Christina Navarro Cabrera. Um, I just recently got married, so if you don't recognize it, Cabrera, it's Navarro. Um, anyways, Christina Navarro, I am fourth generation in Lincoln Heights. Uh, my great grandmother lived there, my grandmother, my parents, and so did I. Um, I went to Sacred Heart of Jesus. I graduated from Wilson. Um, so back in 2017, I founded Healing Urban Barrios. I am the founder and executive director. Um, so been working nonprofits already for over 20 years. Um, but what happened when I was working for gang intervention in the West Side, I have a lot of family still that lives in Lincoln Heights, El Sereno, East LA. Um, a lot of people were dying on this side and a lot of them were my family. And so I kind of quit my jobs and you know, and I was doing well to do in these nonprofits and they were the large multi-million dollar nonprofits. And I started my own. And the first thing I did was I came back home. Um, so my Healing Over Barrios is on Avenue 24. Um, we've been serving now, we started with just two little offices uh, running in one, in one of the buildings. And now we have the big two story building right there, right across the street from the T-Mobile. Um, what have I done for the King Heights? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I can name a lot of stuff, especially since I started with Healing Urban Barrios. Um, we provide the job training. We have the high school program there. We have the internships there. Pre-pandemic, we kind of saw the pandemic coming even to that. We were the first organization in the area to have the food distribution. So I know with the neighborhood council prior to you guys as well, they did help us a lot because we were not only doing the food distribution weekly, we were also delivering to the communities of Lincoln Heights and also, you know, and the surrounding communities as well. Even now we have a good partnership with all the high schools. We have a partnership with the middle schools and we're doing a lot of work as well. Lincoln Heights is home. So um, I don't know if any of you have joined our, our Instagram with Healing Urban Barrios, but there is a short clip. It's like a six minute video. And it even gives you some of my history with Lincoln Heights and everything that I once done to how I feel today. So even in the video I stay, and I really mean it true of heart, where it is kind of like my own form of restorative justice of what I'm doing today because of what I did in my past in the area. Um, I even went to Little Flower. So if everyone knows who Little Flower was, Little Flower is up on the top of the hill where Thomas was, I went to Little Flower as well. So Lincoln Heights is home. Lincoln Heights is home. I hope to have my home back soon, very soon there. My personal home along with my business. Um, that's my spew. And well, what I would do to the neighborhood council is I believe in the preservation and the culture of Lincoln Heights. I do believe in 
you know, making, enhancing it, giving more to the community. I believe in business of the of Lincoln Heights. I believe in the people that work and live in Lincoln Heights. I think it's so important that we support those individuals as well. I believe in what, you know, I don't like seeing empty storefronts at all, but I also believe that we need to train our people to stay in our communities, to own businesses in our communities. And how do we do that with job training, with empowerment of the people of Lincoln Heights? Not everyone's gonna come back, especially for us that are kind of, for lack of a better word, hood, we're told that once we get better, leave the community, go start somewhere else, start fresh. No, we need to teach everyone to invest back in the community. I don't care what hood you're from. You know, I know even the gang wise, I know the gangs very well. I know the older communities. I know some of the younger ones. So I'm very familiar. <laughs> and hey, Christina, uh, okay. sorry to interrupt you. Okay, it's okay. So the time limit there. Oh, there you go. I can keep going, but yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for that. We're going to move over to community uh, comments, questions. Please raise your hand if you have any questions or comments for Cristina Cabrera applying for a community based organization seat. I do not see any hands raised. Um, we're going to move on to board members. If anyone has any questions or comments for Cristina Cabrera, um, Please raise your hand. And I see Sarah's hand raised. Hi, Christina. I have a just a question. So Healing Urban Barrios, um, so it's a grid. Uh, it's part of the. It accepts the grid. Uh, it's part of the grid program. The mayor's grid program, right? Gang reduction, youth development. Yes, we have contracts on the west side, not for Lincoln Heights. Wait, co concerts? What? Contracts on the west side, not for Lincoln Heights. We are not the grid provider for Lincoln Heights. You're not a grid provider for Lincoln Heights. Okay. No. So um, so you're not a LAPD drop-in center? No, we are not an LAPD drop-in center. Okay, because the other grids are, correct? No, that is not what grid is. There is no grid zone that I know of that's an LAPD drop-in center, nor are my offices on the west side LAPD drop-in centers. That is incorrect. Oh, no, I'm just, I, I wasn't making an accusation. I was just saying, oh. so, uh, so, but then you are, do participate in the grid program. Yes. So yeah, uh, we have contracts on the West side. We have the Olympic area, the Pico Union area and the East Hollywood area. But your brick and mortar is in Lincoln Heights, correct? That's, that's home. That's okay. So, um, but then the, the programs in the Lincoln Heights office are our re-entry, our disaster preparedness and our violence intervention prevention services. Okay. And then, um, so then all the functions out of the Lincoln Heights uh, brick and mortar are funded by uh, independent contributions, correct? Independent, we have Department of Labor grants, we have the California Office of Emergency Services, and we have um, the California Violence Intervention Prevention Money and out of Lincoln Heights. And then the hours, so uh, the storefront itself, uh, what are the regular functioning hours of the, of the uh, facility monday through friday nine to five usually unless there's events and then we all have to leave so then it's closed and we go to that event i try to always keep one program assistant there just to help but a lot of times um a lot of my staff is female so one female will keep the door locked but i have a remote entry just for safety as well so you have to ring the doorbell so sometimes people say like oh it looks closed but you have to ring the doorbell because it's remote entry just for safety because okay. if it's one girl in the, in the office, I don't expect her to keep that door open for her safety. Okay, Th thank you, thank you, thank you. No problem. Just a question. Thank you. Um, are there any other hands raised? If not, I'll move with my question. I don't see any hands. To, um, thank you for applying, Cristina. During your um, introduction, you mentioned that you want to enhance Lincoln Heights and alluded to the empty business fronts. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what enhancing Lincoln Heights means to you? Yeah, I believe there should be job creation. It doesn't look nice when you have a lot of empty storefronts, you know, but then you have a lot of youth that could do internships and job training to have jobs at home. And why send a youth out into a different community to do a different internship or job when they don't have cars or even transportation is hard. But if we 
help businesses and we get small business to invest into our area and then we get those small business to invest in our people in our community then we're giving we're enhancing and giving jobs to our youth and our young adults so definitely with what i do with us is we have a whole curriculum of job training when it comes to business etiquette customer service business communication leadership skills including including business management so when i really mean enhances i want to teach my people how to start their own small business as well and then reinvest into their communities. So we don't have these empty Starbucks. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for Christina? I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I have a question. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like you guys, I saw that you, you took the students or healing urban, urban barriers took the young kids to Scientology Center field trip? First, first of all, it's always been, um, no, it wasn't to Scientology. It was a different museum. And I know exactly what post you're talking about. The Museum of uh, Psychiatry. The Museum of Psychiatry. When we used the space to talk about narcotics and the fentanyl use that was going on in the East Hollywood area. So my case manager in the East Hollywood area got a space provided, didn't tell me where, but that's okay, it happens. But we talked about the fentanyl overdose that happened at Bernstein High School. And we had friends directly from that girl that overdosed as well, talking about the overdose. So it wasn't about Scientology. It was about substance use based on what happened at Bernstein High School. Okay. Thank you. We have Jared Gunsberg. Just to follow up on uh, Sarah's question. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the museum that, that Sarah referred to is the Museum of Psychiatry and it's a, a industry of death or museum of death or something like that. Um, did this group that you took laudably for education about fentanyl abuse and the dangers of it, did they take a visit to that museum? I know they used the space. I didn't go with my case manager. I'm, I, I didn't go with the East Hollywood team for that day, but I know they used a space. And that's the way it was, the message was delivered to me and that's the way we requested the trip. Do you know, do you know who presented the program? What do you mean who presented the program? Well, if they were going, if you use the space. I know a case manager in the past has used the space before. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Are there any other questions for our applicant, Cristina Cabrera? I do not see any hands raised. I will present the motion to accept this application. Is there a second? I'll second. Ben seconds, board discussion. Any board members have any comments? I don't see any hands raised. We're gonna go ahead and move forward with a vote. Ben Madera, I see your hand up. Just uh, really quick, um, can you quickly just uh, maybe give the difference between the Soledad Enrichment Action SEA based there at Lincoln Heights and what, what you guys do? Because oh, yeah. to be honest with you, I'm not that familiar with, uh, I've heard of healing urban vadios, I just haven't been familiar with it. Yeah, that's fine. So um, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of SEA, but I know SEA is your grid agency for the Holland Back One area, and the Holland Back One area is Lincoln Heights and um, Al Sereno. So there are specific programming. I, I'm not SEA, so I don't want to speak for them, but I am not the grid provider for that area. SEA is, so that I'm comfortable saying. But what we do um, in the Lincoln Heights office, when we do our reentry, so our reentry is for 18 to 24. We provide job readiness, job training. Um, we have our high school diploma program and we offer supportive services, court advocacy, um, whether it's at the court, probation, parole, um, pretty much just helping those that are 18 to 24 get a second chance, third chance if needed when coming out of incarceration. We have disaster preparedness. Disaster preparedness is for everybody. And I know some of my team has already gone out to see some of the seniors. I believe the next presentation is gonna be at the Senior Rec Center. Um, that's a citywide program as well. What disaster preparedness does, it teaches all community members how to be prepared in case of disaster. So we're in Los Angeles. So a lot of times we have, you know, we have heat wave, 
when we have earthquake. Um, it goes around, they'll go around each house, teaching them how to turn off the gas. We'll be providing those, that equipment as well too. Uh, we are giving CPR first aid for free for our community members focusing. It's for everyone, but however, there is a focus on elderly and those that are not English speaking as well. So all those community services are free too. And then I'll tell them like, what do you have like in a go box, you know, in case of emergency, things you should have on hand at all times. Um, that's a disaster preparedness program. And the violence intervention prevention program, again, it's we focus more towards adults. So Healing or Memorials is in a really good position where we can have the whole curriculum of care, where we have those from 14 and all the way older when it comes to the reentry, re those that have been victims of crime, those we're trying to deter from having, you know, being part of further violence as well, too. We do a lot of community events, engagements, outreach, pop-ups, anything we can do to promote a, a positive message about empowerment, enhancement, enhancement and anything we can do, you know, different exposure to different lifestyles as well. So it, so yeah, so I know say is the grid provider, which is gang reduction youth development. Again, I don't want to speak for them, but those are all the services Healing Urban Barrios offers. Okay, thank you. Are, Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and I just want everybody to know, like being a business rep or a CBO on the board, you're not here on the board to represent your organization, okay? You're oh, yeah. on the board to, I just want all the CBOs and everybody to know that when you're on the board, you're here to represent, if you're a CBO, you would represent and interface with other CBOs and then, you know, sort of. And we do that already where, I mean, it's hard. It's so it's kind of hand in hand, Sarah. So I like that comment because I, I think I brought Hub to Lincoln Heights because I wanted to come home because I knew what I was capable of and the services that I could offer at home. You know, so then to flip it and now be like, Christina's just going to represent people from Lincoln Heights is totally different. If Hub and Christina go hand in hand, yeah, sure, it does. Like, I, I can't help it. It's personal to me. It's extremely personal to me. The people are personal to me. So if I could use what I have created to help my people, that's how it kind of goes hand in hand. So that it's not to represent Hub, Hub, Hub. I, I get that 100%. But, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. Well, both like ventures are personal. personal. Like analyze, hyper analyzing an organization. It's like, it's kind of like, that's not really, the organization's kind of secondary to the role. Oh, of course. No, now it's about making home better. So um, 719 now. So we're, we're going to um, continue with the vote, Fernanda. All right. We're going to go ahead and move forward with the vote. Um, the motion is to approve Christina's application for a community business organization. A yes vote is to approve the application. A no vote is to reject it. Um, we're going to start with Sarah. No. Ben. Uh, yes, this is for the 2023. 2023 or 2025. Christina, 2023. Can, can you tell me about that? I'm sorry. This is for the 2025. Um, oh, there's only, got the 2023. So there's only two 2025 seats left. So you would be, the seat would end in 2025, Christina. Okay, that sounds good to me. Sorry. So uh, Ben? Or ben it, yes. Chente? No. Nancy is excused. Benny? Benny Madera. Sorry about that. Uh, 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 no. Annalie? No. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? No. Lydia? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? Gil Arevalo? I will return to you, Richard. Upstairs. Fernanda, my vote is yes. My my speaker keeps going, gets muted. I'm sorry. I, gotta Gil, I, I am muting your mic when other people are speaking because the background noise interrupts everybody. Um, Gil, I have you as a yes. 
Yes. Richard, abstain. Steve? Abstain. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. <coughs> and Fernanda? No. That is seven yes, six no, two abstain. The motion carries. Okay, motion carries. Congratulations, Christina. CBO, <laughs> I will send you the, the board onboarding documents. Thank right. you so much. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. All right. So for both applicants that have just been voted in, I'm going to go ahead and send an onboarding email before the end of the week. So please um, stay a lookout for that. Thank you. Right. Okay, so uh, we're going to um, skip the items seven A and B. We're just going to move them. I'm going to move eight A to the end. We're going to move right now to one of the land use items eight uh, B. Now this is the presenter is. Kaysen Hall, is Kaysen still here? Okay, Kaysen, yeah. So we're gonna move Kaysen Hall as a presenter. So this is um, discussion of possible action on 2465 North Metzler Drive and 2501 to 2503 North Forest Park, Park Drive, Hillside Grading, new construction. This is below Paradise Hill, right at the bottom of Paradise Hill. Case number EMV 2021-6721-CE. Links are all on the agenda. It's Grading Hillside provo proposed, um, OWTS, that's an on-site water, wastewater treatment system for new single family residents. Uh, case number ZA 2021-6720-ZAD. It's uh, the proposed building is a new 1,490 square foot prefabricated steel hut on retaining wall with carport. They're asking for, um, basically it's a substandard road. It's not big enough, uh, you can't turn around. Uh, so they asked, you know, there was a zoning variance um, requested for that. And so uh, there's new applications for um, digging a sewer, uh, water treatment system, um, approximately 2,000 gallons pit, six foot diameter by 50 feet wide, 18 foot cap, 32 foot affected depth. This is on a hillside, hillside grading, right? Um, so we have Kaysen Hall. Uh, the applicant is Anthony, Anthony Converse. Um, and so this went through the Planning and Land Use Committee meeting on November 16th. The Planning and Land Use Committee recommended to oppose based on uh, the fact that, uh, so it's a site that uh, the street itself is a paper road and there's no turnaround for fire. Um, so they will have to widen the road or whatever, but uh, the site itself, it's uh, a kind of, a, it's not going to be connected to the main sewer line of the city. It's going to have to have its own sewer system because it's in a remote site. Um, and uh, it's part of it's in a landslide zone and the fact, yeah, so whatever. So uh, it was uh, opposed just based on those reasons with it being a, um, the hillside grading is very sensitive and uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we have the uh, presenter here uh, just to do a couple minute presentation on exactly what it is. Uh, Case and Hall, just to remind, uh, just to show the board exactly um, some visuals. So is Case in a presenter? Oh, there she is. If she could share her screen. Hi, good evening. Um, okay, it says that the screen share is disabled. I went ahead and enabled it. You can try again. Okay, cool. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening and thank you, Sarah, for the intro. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, we presented a few weeks ago to the Planning and Land Use Committee. So I'll just kind of run through our presentation 
um, quickly for a few minutes just to kind of get everyone um, up to speed. So the proposed project is for a new single family dwelling in the Lincoln Heights Hillside area. And the subject uh, request is for the zoning administrator determination for relief from improving the substandard hillside street to 20 feet to the boundary of the hillside area and for relief from improving the substandard hillside street to 20 feet adjacent to the subject lot. So the subject site is situated along Forest Park Drive, which is also known as Metzler Drive interchangeably. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, the portion of Metzler shown on city records to the south of the sub south of the subject site is a paper street and does not actually exist um, in person. So the widening relief, uh, which is the subject of this, this request would be for the portion of Forest Park to the north and then along Commodore to the boundary of the hillside area. So you can see that here, these um, green areas and the subject site is shown in blue. Um, so this zigzag uh, is the paper street that I mentioned. Um, so the proposed house is a little over 1,000 square feet and consists of a modified prefabricated steel structure. The house consists of a communal living and dining area, two bedrooms, one bathroom, and a carport, and it's uh, 15 feet at its highest point. In response to the environmental issues confronted when designing in the hillside district, the house is of non-combustible construction employing a steel roof and internal fire prevention sprinkler system. The applicant has lived in Los Angeles as a renter for the last 32 years and has owned the subject property for 15 years. He's maintained the property by clearing brush, maintain, maintaining the trees on site and managing storm water, water flow as legally mandated. The proposed house uh, sets a precedent of modest, environmentally sensitive design in the community and encourages stewardship for the hillside. The entire property will become greener and more physically stable because of the proposed project. Additionally, the proposed design has been thoroughly vetted by Department, Department of City Planning Northeast Hillside Ordinance Planners for compliance with that overlay zone. So the property is located on a hill sloping upward in the western direction from Forest Park Drive, and there are presently several small shrubs, two mature trees, and light vegetation on the property. There are no tree removals associated with the request. And an existing fire hydrant, um, which was installed in 2001, is located directly to the north. And there is a fire hose affixed to the concrete wall uh, located at 2507 Forest Park to the north, as you can see here in this photo. Um, and the fire prevention infrastructure ensures increased safety for the applicant and his neighbors at this um, hillside area. The project proposes improved paved roadway, a paved drive aisle, and slope stabilization adjacent to Forest Park Drive for improving road stability. And since the road is existing non-conforming within 300 feet of a fire hydrant and provides 150 foot access from the public right of way to proposed dwelling, the project does not propose an LAFD standard turnaround per instruction by Inspector Duff on November 20th, 2020. And slide. Um, so just a bit of site history, there was a previous entitlement for this exact same ZAD request approved in 2008, the, though the applicant never returned to effectuate the case and the approval expired. Um, thus the resubmittal with the subject request. And in conjunction with that previous case, the property owner processed a dedication of a portion of Forest Park to the city. Um, that process was initiated in 2023 and finalized in 2020. Um, and enclosed in the package delivered to the council, there are two letters of support from neighbors at 2449 Metzler and 2445 Metzler. Both neighbors have lived on the terminus of Forest Park for a number of years and are in support of the project and state that the applicant has been a good neighbor for the last 15 years that he's owned the land. And getting to the conclusion, um, with regard to the subject request, increasing the road width to the boundary of the hillside area would cause a loss of existing natural features, trees, fences, and other improvements. And it would also prove difficult due to the extreme grade change to the east and west of the road along Forest Park and Commodore. These improvements would prove unbeneficial as there are only three additional single family homes that share this terminus of Forest Park, while there are nearly 30 single family homes along Forest Park and Commodore that would be impacted by street widening. Additionally, increasing the road width adjacent to the subject lot is also impractical. Civil engineering has shown that there would be significant grading, retaining walls, and other costly improvements required to complete this, which is not proportional to the proposed project. So in conclusion, the applicant has proposed an appropriately designed and scaled single family home on the subject lot. The code required improvements to the public right of way are out of proportion with the proposed project and would require considerable grading, disturbance to natural features and current residents and be very costly. Despite this, the applicant has proposed various right of way improvements such as new paving, grading and stabilization, which will positively affect the surrounding neighborhood. The applicant has also attained considerable support from neighboring owners. 
So with this, we hope that the council will uh, reconsider and support the applicant's request for relief from the road widening requirements. And we really appreciate your time this evening and we're open to any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Kaysen. Okay, so we're gonna open it up to community questions. If there's anybody from the community who has a question for Kaysen or wants to make a comment, please press star nine or raise your hand. You have two minutes. I do not see any hands raised. Hey, board members, do you have any uh, anything, any questions for Kaysen? Or statements? We have Didia. Thank you. And thank you, Kaysen. I appreciate the, uh, the time that you've taken and the presentation that you made. I appreciate also the long time that the owner of the property has lived in our community and maintained the property uh, um, appropriately complying with city brush clearance requirements. Um, I just want to say that I, I appreciate the small size of the building. The neighborhood council has been opposed to much larger residences in the past because we have felt them to be out of scale uh, with other, other buildings in the neighborhood. In this case, I want to point out not, not about the scale of the building, because I appreciate its small size, but rather that um, building a house out of steel um, will not protect you in case of fire. Having a turnaround for fire trucks is not just so that they can get out, it's because they can't come in if they can't get out. There will be no rescue for the neighbor, for the residents, residents the, the father and daughter who will live in this home. And we've, those of us who've lived here for three decades of I, as I have, have all seen fires on our hillsides. So I have an enormous concern about the safety of, of our neighbors ongoing and future. I also wanna point out that I have a real concern about um, the self-contained sewer system. I appreciate the ingenuity and the cost in installing that. I think that for the neighborhood council, who have gone on the record in the past as so highly valuing our pristine and centuries long protected undisturbed wilderness landscapes on our hillsides. I, I think that allowing self-contained sewage treatment plants is an open door to future construction. And so I have a real concern about that. Thank you. Thank you, Didia. Thank you, Didia. Um, are there any other comments from the boards or question? We have Selena. Hi, I just wanted to know if the applicant, like if, did he come to the planning and land use or has he always sent a representative? Um, I believe he's on the call today. Um, he might be in the in the like waiting room webinar. Um, but I, I've been handling the uh, presentations and the interfacing with Department of City Planning. Thank you. All right. And to answer your question, Selena, on the Planning and Land Use Committee, I did see the applicant's name on the attendee side, but he did not participate in the meeting. Um, that being said, I do want to give an insight as to the planning and land use committee meeting. There was a lot of public comment on this item and most of it was opposition for this uh, project. There were a lot of community members concerned about the safety, um, as well as preserving you know, the last few green spaces, undeveloped hills in our community. And I think those comments should definitely be represented at this meeting as well. Um, I wanted to ask very quickly, Kaysen, um, thank you so much for your application and for being here and at the last meeting as well. Um, just to clarify, during the last 15 years um, that the applicant has owned that land, he hasn't developed anything on that land, right? No, so there was that previous um, entitlement in 2008, but that project never went forward. Um, and so that entitlement has lapsed. Um, yeah, and now he's returning to uh, to try to build the, build the home on the property. Thank you for clarifying that. I ask that because I do think the letters of support that are listed um, are a bit misleading. Um, if there hasn't been any development for 15 years, how much of a neighbor can you really be? For the last 15 years, um, 
And so uh, the Planning and Land Use Committee voted against this project. And I just wanted to echo the uh, comments and statements from the public at the last meeting. Um, and that's it for me. Are there any other board member questions or comments? Yeah, I just have a comment. It's like uh, when somebody buys, like, like this is right at the bottom of um, Paradise Hill, right? So Paradise Hill is a, a 30 acre tract that uh, we we're trying to kind of save and get back in the city because it was sold under dubious conditions in the 60s, right? And so this is very contentious land. Uh, they tried to make it into a trash dump in the 50s and the community fought that. Um, so, uh, and then also just the nature of the land itself being a uh, Miocene sandstone, it just turns to dirt. So when there's um, rain, it forms a mudslide and this, the hill just turns to powder. So it's very serious. So um, when people buy a piece of land and the grade is too sharp or whatever, you can't build, or you can't, you know, it's too far away from the sewer is the answer to like have your own septic tank and then make some thing where fire trucks can't get to it. Uh, it puts other people's health, um, health safety and welfare at risk. And so that's what we have to vote on is the health, safety and welfare of our community and surrounding, you know, even just uh, the environmental issues, right? And uh, so it's kind of a bigger thing of whether like somebody has the right to buy a, build a house. It's like, well, where do you have the right to build a house, right? In the most uh, remote, you know, uh, unreachable place, well, it's gonna affect other people and even that person as well in a fire. And that, uh, that's my statement. Uh, any other board members? So we're gonna uh, make a, a motion. Does anybody wanna move on this? Any board members? I make a motion. Mm -hmm. What's your motion? Selena, you, do you move to? Well, we have to take a vote on it, right? Yeah, so you're gonna move and we're gonna get a second. Okay, we're... so did, do I just say exactly what's on the agenda? Or do I just oh, say? You can just say like, I move to oppose or I move to approve. Okay, well, because I'd like to echo the sentiment of the uh, result at the planning and land use, I uh -huh. vote or I move to reject this project um, in its entirety, the way it's been presented on the agenda. Okay, do we have a second? I second, Ms. Stadia. Okay, we have I'll a first and second. So uh, any other board member comment? Nope, I just wanna thank Selena for making the motion. It was brilliant. Right, so we have, okay. So any uh, community member comments on this before we go for a vote? I don't see any other board member comments um, and I also want to encourage board members, we can start practicing making our motions. Um, so thank you for presenting that, Selena. Um, I want to encourage everyone to be able to make motions. Um, all right, so Selena presented the motion to oppose this project, seconded by Didia. A yes vote is to oppose the project. A no vote is to approve the project. Um, <clears throat> Since to go against the opposition. Um, any board discussion? Sorry, can you repeat that last part? Um, a no vote is to approve the project, and I just emphasize that a no would be opposing the opposition, and therefore approving the project. Um, all right, we're going to go ahead and move forward with a vote. Sarah? Yes. Opposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ben? Yes. Chente? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Nancy is excused. Benny? Yes. Anna Lee? Yes. Anna. Yes. Sylvia? Yes, opposed. Melanie? Yes. Didia? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? No. Richard? 
Simone. Steve. Yes. Selena. Yes. Esmeralda. Yes. That is 14 yes, one no. Motion carries. The project has been opposed. Okay, uh, uh, Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Kason, for presenting multiple times. I really appreciate it. Of course. Have a great evening. Come back with, you know, if you guys have any other changes or anything. We All will. Right. Thanks a lot. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to the next item real quick. Do do do. We have Didia's hand up, I believe. Um... Thank you, Fernanda. We're more than 90 minutes in. We have a full agenda still to follow. I'd request a couple of minutes for health and safety break. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right, so we're gonna take a um, five, five minute break here. Uh, just so everybody knows. Um, so can somebody run a timer? We'll be back at 747. Okay, 747. So uh, yeah, I kind of rearranged the agenda a little bit just because of the land use issues. So uh, see, uh, okay, so we did B. And we're gonna do C and then D. Oh wait, C, all right, one, one second. B, D, C, and then E. So uh, yeah, the next few will be quick. And then we go to one bigger one of the uh, E 216 South Avenue 24. And then we have um, just some uh, demolition issues, but you know, items, if it, you know, we don't want to run too long. So my role as the president to DJ the time. Great, so we'll be on break until 7.47. If any board members want to talk. I'm at Marcelino's. Say what? I'm at Marcelino's. You're at Marcelino's, all right. Community Center. Yeah, so we have a lot of holiday events go happening. You know, let's run back down those holiday events real quick. All my paperwork. All right, so here are our holiday events. There's going to be a holiday event at Lincoln Heights Recreation Center on December 17th. Maybe I can make it chronological here. All right, so Saturday, December 3rd, uh, at the funeral home, funeral it's all angel across from uh, KFC on Citral. December 3rd, holiday carolongs, caroling and sing-along tree lighting ceremony, uh, 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, they're going to have uh, gifts and uh, pictures with Santa. So that's December 3rd, Saturday, this Saturday. And then on December 10th, there's a breakfast at Sa with Santa at Hazard Park Recreation Center. And there's a toy giveaway. The breakfast with Santa is from 9.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. And the toy giveaway is at noon. Um, free gifts for uh, kids ages 1 to 17 years old. So that's December 10th at Hazard Rec. And then on the 17th at Lincoln Heights Recreation Center, there is another holiday event. Uh, yeah, holiday event, December 17th. I don't have the time. Um, and so those are our three holiday events in Lincoln Heights. And right now, the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council has nine vacancies, or wait, actually seven vacancies because we filled two. So if anybody from the public is interested in getting a seat on the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council, I will tell you what the seats are. And you can email Secretary Sanchez or go to our link in bio, it's lhnc.carrd.co for all the paperwork, application information, 
Secretary Sanchez's email is fernanda.sanchezlhnc at gmail.com. So these are our vacancies. Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council a Youth Representative seat. So that's for any high school student who wants to be on the council. You get extra credit towards college, I think, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we have a uh, business representative. Sarah, I'm sorry, this is Jared. I had a question about that, actually. Yeah. How how young can the youth rep be? Ben, what, ben, what are you on the call, Ben? Can you tell us? I think it's uh, 14 to 17 years old. 14 to 17? OK. All right, yeah. good to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we have business rep seat ending in 20. It is 14. It's 14, Ben? Yes. Okay. We Thank used to have you. youth rep seats and they took one away from us. But it's one of the most important seats. So, um, I mean, they're all important. But So we have a business rep seat ending in 2025. So that's for anybody who works at a business or is associated with a business or gets permission from a business to uh, use that criteria to be on the board. And you don't represent your business on the council. You actually just end up being, you're sort of the business liaison with the other businesses. Um, and then we have a community-based board representative seat that ends in 2020, which one did we do? 2025. So yeah, if you are associated with any community-based org, or if you run one, or if you get permission from one, that could be a tenants union, it could be a church, it could be a food giveaway, anything. Um, you would, yeah, so just apply and then uh, you, you don't represent your community-based org on the board. You just kind of interface with the other ones in the neighborhood and come back to headquarters and report back what's going on and what, you know, issues, all that. And then we have uh, area three rep resident seat ending in 2023. Area three is the, we have our little map on our bio, but it goes from uh, Lincoln Park all the way up to Broadway pretty much. And uh, so we really need an area three rep resident seat. So resident means that you live in that area because you know we need somebody representing Lincoln Park because it's getting pulled up, you know, there's a lot of activity happening down there. Sarah, it's Jared again. I had another quick question before we go because I'm the at-large rep for area three, but I live in area three. And I think when I apply to the board, I I, I don't think I you know, put all that together. Uh -huh. So we can, I don't know if this is appropriate to discuss now. I could run for the other seat. Well, you could just change your or seat. Or I could, I could, or change my seat, whatever. We can talk, you know, when we have more time about. Yeah, I can, because I, you've got, there's a lot of work to be done down there. You know, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Especially with land use and, and the health with the moving of, you know, with a lot of trucks moving around and stuff. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so we have area three, and then we have two area four rep seats open, and these are super important. So this is all south of uh, Valley Boulevard. Um, so the area which now USC is occupying much of, and then uh, it goes to Soto. So it includes Hazard Park. Now it doesn't include Ramona Gardens. Ramona Gardens is unrepresented. So that whole area on the other side of Soto has no representation, any council. But you know, there are pockets of neighborhoods, you know, parts of Lincoln Heights still down there, like uh, where uh, behind the Jack in the Box on Workman there, there's apartment buildings that, uh, you know, if you live in those apartment buildings, yeah, hit us up. And then also on Charlotte Street and Chicago and State. It's 750. Okay, 750. All right, so let's start the B meeting again. All right, so here we go. So this one, um, I'm just going to run through this one pretty quick. I don't know if the representatives here, John. All right. So uh, this one is a big deal. We're on item C. Uh, discussion and possible action on 3880 North Mission Road, grading, de demolition, new construction. This is the former Forever 21 site, and it has 17 addresses under it. And they have about 21 by right, like, you know, construction permits. But for this one, they they have, they're asking <laughs> case number ENV 2022-6550-EAF, grading, special grading area, standalone e EAF, environmental assessment form for haul route for approximately 240 
285,493 cubic yards of dirt in a special grading area in conjunction with the redevelopment of a warehouse logistics and light industry facility zoned M1-1. So on uh, November 16th, 2022, the PLUC recommended to oppose this uh, application as is with uh, conditions and the conditions being that we want a full environmental report, uh, full, Vince, what is a full CEQA? Uh, basically it's such, it's an, um, it's a special grading area because it's a water, it's where the, uh, the reservoir was, there's water tributaries there and they're basically importing the 285,493 cubic yards of dirt through, we don't know how many truckloads. So that's a lot of um, pollution and, you know, activity, right? Um, also the property uh, recently sold, okay? For like $190 million. And so uh, the applicant is kind of making it seem that they're trying to ready it for a new sale or use, which could be have to do with residential, like a new rezoning. Um, so they're kind of prepping it for uh, maybe it could be like a distribution warehouse for, I don't know, whatever major retail. Uh, so we opposed it because of the health, safety, and welfare of the community having to breathe in 200 and, you know, how many truckloads it takes to move 285,493,000 cubic yards of dirt. And uh, yeah, the representative is not, you know, uh, they're not here, but um, hopefully, uh, you know, we would write a letter to the city recommending a new and full environmental report. Okay. And uh, that's it. So uh, any board, any, anybody from the community have any questions about the Forever 21 site? Any statements about this application? Please raise your hand or press star nine. Mega site. All right. Any board members have any anything to say? Didia? Thank you, Sarah. I just wanted to draw the neighborhood council's attention to the fact that um, th these large warehouse sites like this or a proposed warehouse sites, um, they're really turning small neighborhood industrial businesses and, and land uses into large scale industrial land uses that that are not owned by residents of our community or people who live in our community um, and work in our community. For example, very nearly across the street from this proposed three huge warehouse lot, um, there's an enormous Amazon warehouse facility that has been empty since it was built and completed about a year or two ago during the pandemic. Um, there's there's no evidence that these are successful or profitable. That Amazon warehouse took the place of lots of small neighborhood businesses, whether they were industrial or otherwise commercial. They were all neighborhood shops and artists' places. And I, I, I don't think that um, turning small land uses into large ones is appropriate for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, and Fernanda, could I share my screen real quick? I just want to show people something kind of special. All right, here we go. So, so this was just from the applicants. I don't know if this is really tiny, if you can see it, but this is from their application. So these are the existing warehouses on the Forever 21 site. Now they have uh, applications to demolish to a certain extent, a bunch of these and sort of what they're trying to do is move in all this dirt, 293,000 cubic yards to pack like a basement level and, and fill it in. Um, but I wanna show you just the special thing about this site. Now this was the original, God, I forget, it was called Schutzen, Schutzen Park, I forget, but, um, Okay, here's a aerial photo from 1920. Is the hospital there? 1927. So yeah, this park itself, it was, or, you know, where the proposed site is. So where my little cursor is, that was the Sea League Zoo. Okay, so, uh, and then down here is Lincoln Park. So Sea League Zoo, he had built like a jungle for Tarzan. And, and this is a, it was called Schoetzen Park. Um, there was a shooting range. In any case, the uh, 
Arroyo de, de las Pulsas ran down here. So this has always been a swamp land, uh, swamp land meaning fertile land where a lot of plants grow and stuff. Um, so uh, in the, you know, unfortunately this most precious area was rezoned for uh, industrial uses. We don't know why. And so it, you know, is how it is today. But uh, yeah, what was I gonna say? Uh, but originally, this was the site of um, reservoir number five, one of the earliest reservoirs, you know, the city of LA with the, the east side ditch used to run down here and fill it up. And then Zanha number 9E went down to Boyle Heights. And so, uh, you know, it's a pretty historic site uh, for being sort of the reason why our neighborhood's even here. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, and then you have Ascot Raceway over here, and you know, the ostrich farm and the alligator farm, and and this is actually on the site is where they used to feed all the lions. Like they'd have all these carcasses rotting, um, because Rose Hill residents used to complain about the smell of rotting uh, animal carcasses. But in any case, I just want everybody to know that you know the environmental thing is real with the special grading area and all that. And, you know, we're trying to save Ascot Hills and Paradise Hill and all that. Well, this is where the water is. And now it's being run in a sewer under the ground. Sarah. Um, yeah. Um, I would I'm, like to move that we uh, I'm gonna, uphold the recommendation of Pluck mm -hmm. uh, to oppose this project. Uh, the purpose of the committees is to hear all of this stuff. Um, yeah, and that's okay. so that so we can rehear it again sorry, during I'm the meeting. Yet. All right, so then we're gonna, um, Ben's gonna move. And do we have a second? You must stop sharing. I second. I second. All right, so they second. So, uh, any uh, other discussion on this? No, all right. Um, Sarah, the I mean, we're we're rejecting this project until an environmental review is done. Correct. We're not voting on the project. We're demanding that an environmental full environmental review be done. Yes. Right, but what surprises me is you would think a, a project of this magnitude isn't wouldn't it come with an environmental review? I wow. mean, the fact that we're having to ask for one for me is is shocking. No, I think that it's by right. So they're just demoing and then redoing stuff with mezzanine levels just to ready it for something. But in the future, there's going to be something that there's going to be a change of use in the land, most likely. You don't, know, uh, but that's for the, you know, we just have to keep tabs on this. This is really mega. And like, unfortunately, we were kept out of the loop on a lot of this discussion by our, our council member. All right, so any other uh, discussion? I'm gonna go for a vote then. All right, motion is to per oppose the project as presented, um, seconded by Chente. We're gonna move on to a vote. A yes uh, vote is to oppose the project. A no vote is to approve the project. I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify, I thought I heard that it was to demand a full environmental review or we were voting to approve the findings of the of the committee of the land planning and land use committee. We're, we're posing the basically the it's not it's the case number it's ENV it's an environmental assessment form so we're Understood. without you know we're, re we're recommending a, a full. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's not really a project, it's a, uh, what would it be, Vince, what's it called? Um, well, then we're recommending, first of all, to, to oppose it as is, mm -hmm. the rec with the recommendation that a full environmental impact report be required on the site. Mm -hmm. This way, when the motion goes before the um, the city planning commission, <coughs> they understand that if, if, if it is <coughs> or they're not required to do an environmental <coughs> And we're on the record opposing. Okay. Thank you. That's a clarification I needed. Thank you. Okay. So, um, right. 
move forward to a vote. Sarah? So yes to oppose as is. That's correct. Ben? Yes. Chanta? Yes. Ben, yes. Nancy is excused. Benny? Yes. Emily? Yes. Sylvia? Yes, opposes. Melanie? Yes. Didia? Yes. Jaren? Yes. Gil? Yes. Richard? Simon. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. That's unanimous. 15 yeses. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. So we're gonna um, skip a couple things here. We're gonna skip uh, D, we're gonna maybe push that to the end. We're gonna go straight to E, discussion and possible action on 216 South Avenue 24. And we have uh, Mary Jean Wagley and maybe, oh, Yoko and, Okay, so I think they're the only ones on here. Okay, so I'm just gonna read. Marquee is Marquee on here. Okay, so I'm gonna read the thing. Okay, so uh, 216 South Avenue 24, grading slash new construction. Now these are the two city lots behind Bank of America on North Broadway. If all board members could mute their, their microphones, please. Um, this is case number, now this is city. Yeah, okay. Case number DIR 2022-7634-TOCCDOPHP-HCA and case number ENV 2022-7635-EAF. Okay, building, new. Construction use of means of a 74 foot height, six story apartment building with 48 units, 100% reserved for affordable households. The project provides 50 parking spaces and approximately 6,075 square feet of OS, open space. Um, so on uh, November 16th, 2022, the PLUC uh, recommended to oppose, um, I could just name the basic reasons, um, the covenant, 55 year covenant, um, public private partnership, uh, city land and partnership with uh, private entities managing the land, um, uh, the, the, the parking lots themselves being needed and um, uh, the priority of Lincoln Heights, Lincoln Heights residents not getting priority on the units. Um, and then also just based on the um, thing itself that they can't get priority on it. Uh, and then um, the other, you know, the, the, this, there are five lots in total. So this is just one. And the fact that there are 12 lots total in the whole city and then five are being concentrated in like five of these projects are being concentrated in Lincoln Heights and the other one being that one of the other reasons being that um the Cornfield Arroyo specific plan we have a lot of city land in Lincoln Heights and why uh just these city lots when it's not the jail site or just these huge pieces of unused property right now we have uh, the presenters on, on the line here, and there are two or three addresses associated with the case. It's 216 South Avenue 24, 220 South Avenue 24, and 224 South Avenue 24. Mary Jane Wagley. And uh, yeah, and so on the agenda, we have all the links to all the files. Here. So they're going to do a little presentation for the community. We're going to do some community Q&A feedback and uh, board member questions and then go for a vote. If the presenters want to raise their hands so that I can go ahead and promote them to panelists. So it's Mary Jean, yeah. And then, uh, okay. All right, Mary Jane has been promoted.
Mary Jane? I think she can hear us. Just so everybody knows, we have 18 panelists and 17 attendees on the meeting right now. So you're not doing this alone. Now, Mary Jane, can you, can you uh, hear me? Oh, there you are. Hey. Hello? Fernanda? Mary Jane, you are muted. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay, great. Hi. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Mary Jane Wagley. I'm the co-CEO of Women Organizing Resources, Knowledge, and Services, the primary uh, provider of uh, uh, developer of this project. Uh, we're, we're honored to present this to you again this evening and hope you will change your minds and support the project as a much needed enhancement to the community. Uh, a little about WORKS. WORKS is a nonprofit affordable housing group formed in 1998 by a group of women experienced in the affordable housing arena. Uh, we have a shared commitment to building affordable housing that can be sustained over the long term and supported by services that help residents move forward on their own life plans. We've housed over 4,000 people over the past two decades, developing more than 1,500 units, including both affordable multifamily housing for the general public, as well as permanent supportive housing for special needs households and formerly unhoused individ individuals. All of our units have always been and will continue to be affordable to households and families at or below 60% of median income. Today, we're talking about our first proposed development on a city owned parking lot in Lincoln Heights. Um, we've had a long history in the Lincoln Heights community. We've developed two properties near the Gold Line Station in 2005 and 2006. And we've been involved in several proposals trying to benefit the Lincoln Heights community over the last decade. Our focus on this property began in 2016 with the proposal to the city at the city's um, uh, request to develop um, five city owned parking lots in Lincoln Heights with affordable housing. After we were awarded the exclusive right to negotiate by the city, we conducted extensive community outreach over two years from 2018 to the pandemic in 2020 and learned, um, among other things, that affordable housing for families and seniors is highly desired, that parking is an issue, especially for local business, that design in keeping with the surrounding neighborhood, Spanish or craftsman style, is preferred, and that pollution and environmental quality matters to the community. We believe this project responds to all of those issues. Um, I'm going to move forward on the, wait one second. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so th these were the projects in the, uh, Boyle, um, in the Lincoln Heights area. Uh, so this is just shows you the actual site. Um, it, the lot is just south of the alley, south of the Bank of America building, with the Bank of America parking lot itself to remain just to the south. The development will be a large family development, 48 units with uh, one, two, and three bedroom units. The building is six stories above the ground, uh, with one level of underground parking. Although we are not required to do so under affordable housing ordinances, we have elected to include 47. It says uh, your presentation said 50, but it's 47 parking spaces so that the development uh, does not impose more cars on existing street and neighborhood parking. This particular lot was assessed by the Department of Transportation to be uh, low utilization and therefore does not require replacement parking. All of the other lots would require replacement parking and we would not move forward on those unless we could solve that problem. Um, <clears throat> we um, have included open space in the side yards in a courtyard on the second floor and a roof deck on the sixth floor. Amenities currently in the design include two recreation rooms, office space for management and 
uh, service providers, a tot lot, community gardening plots, seating areas, a dog run, a landscaping in the courtyard and the deck, as well as in the front yard, north side yard and rear yard. We'll be upgrading the sidewalk and, and curb cuts on South Avenue 24 and adding street trees. And we will also be widening the alley adjacent to our property by three feet and repaving it. All of the units <clears throat> will be affordable to families at or below 60% of median income with rents as shown here. And we are attempting to include a significant share of the units um, uh, as special needs units for de develop developmentally disabled persons and households that are survivors of domestic violence, which will be affordable at 30% of median shown in the lower half of this screen. Um, the Lincoln Heights community indicated it was concerned. Oops, sorry, wrong slide. There we go. It was concerned about environmental impact. We've designed the project to be all electric with solar or PV panels on the roof, enabling us to lower utility costs for residents and to minimize our carbon footprint. We've included uh, several other water and energy conserving materials and methods throughout the building. Um, here's a rendering of the building, Spanish style as uh, desired. I think the architects have done a really great job of creating varied massing so that the building almost has the feel of a village. The units are laid out in a C shape around a central courtyard open to the south. The next two slides show the elevations from all four sides, which again show the articulation of the facades and show how the building steps back at the fifth and sixth floors so that it feels like a four and five story building from the street. Uh, we just recently submitted our entitlement request to the city and we're asking for approval of a plan which is permitted under the transit oriented communities program for 100% affordable housing. I want to address very briefly a couple of issues raised during our planning committee presentation. There was, as Sarah mentioned, concern about the long-term commitment to affordability, about the possibility of rents being raised, and about whether local Lincoln Heights residents would be future tenants. With respect to long-term affordability, the land will continue to be owned by the city and will be ground leased to us as the developer for up to 99 years. Throughout that ground lease term, we will be required to maintain the units as affordable. At the end of the ground lease term, the property reverts to the city. The financing for the development also from the city, the state, the federal government, and potentially the county will also restrict the rents and affordability for a minimum of 55 years. Rent increases are set by the government and generally track inflation to allow the building to cover operating costs on an ongoing basis while remaining affordable at the income levels that are mandated. With respect to those who will be future tenants, Currently, fair housing law established by the federal government and enforced by the city requires that we or any other developer or any other owner or the city itself make the units available to any household that meets eligi eligibility requirements through widespread advertising and outreach. This typically means that we have a one month application period and we let local and countywide organizations and publications know that the application period is open. Those who, are apply, who apply are placed in a lottery pool and tenants are selected by lottery as mandated by the city. There can be no priority under current law for local residents. However, city council is currently exploring the possibility of a local preference preference for local community residents. Uh, if they were, if they decided to go forward with that, uh, that pr proposal, they would have to uh, apply to the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development to get permission to make that happen, a process that takes uh, many months, if not years. We would favor that. We would like to see that be a possibility. And if, uh, if the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council is concerned about this issue as well in general, we would strongly recommend that the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council also advocate for this kind of a rule. But at the moment, given the dramatic need for affordable housing, we're all operating under the laws that exist now. Um, <clears throat> in closing, 
we very much hope that the neighborhood council will act to support this high priority 100% affordable housing development. We have received significant support from the community. I have provided to uh, Sarah and um, hope will be included ultimately in the um, in the package uh, letters from just two of the support the groups that are supporting this. One of them from the uh, New Life Church in Lincoln Heights, and one of one from the East Side Housing for All. These letters are signed by more than fifty-two people um, in this in the community and the surrounding communities. So we we very much hope that you will reconsider your uh, prior opposition and consider supporting this development. Thank you for your time. And I'd love to answer questions. <clears throat> I will stop screen sharing. Um, Thank you, Mary Jean, for your presentation. All right, so um, we're gonna open it up now for um, community uh, questions for Mary Jane or any statements. So if you're from the public and you wanna make a statement, please raise, raise your hand or press star nine. You have two minutes to speak. And Fernando will keep picking. We have G. Hi, I don't know if you could see me. I think you could just hear me, correct? All right. Um, hello, neighborhood council members. Thank you so much for your service to our community. My name is Ji Sun. I'm a professor at Cal State LA and a mom whose kids attend Gates Elementary School and a member of New Life Community Church in Lincoln Heights. And I fully support the Grace, <clears throat> Grace Villa's affordable family housing development. A recent study from the Chancellor's Office at Cal State has found that one in 10 CSU students experience housing insecurity, and this is untenable. Students who want to attend Cal State LA, which is notable for being number one in the nation in improving social mobility of our students, are just as impacted by displacement, gentrification, overcrowding, and homelessness as other Los Angelinos. And our students are often from the surrounding community, and this is the kind of Cal State that we want to be. They need affordable options, and they need them fast. Grace Villas is just one small step in providing much needed units in this Lincoln Heights neighborhood. This is a concrete step to help clo close to 100 vulnerable community families um, to secure the housing that they can afford. And the works team has shown real compassion for our community. And we, per we really are thankful that they would provide um, these housing units that would bring hope and relief to many who need housing the most and do so for decades to come. So I just want to voice my full throated support. I'm sorry, I'm a little sick right now. So I have a little scratchy throat, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you. We have Veronica next. Hi, can you hear me now? Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you and echo uh, G's comment. Thank you for your service to uh, our city. And uh, I am Veronica Torres McLean, and I am a member of New Life Community Church in Lincoln Heights. I am a resident of El Sereno, previously lived in Boyle Heights. And um, I, work, I worked as a teacher at Farmdale, Farmdale Elementary School. And I work for the Center for Equity for English Learners at the moment. And I am calling uh, to share my support for the Grace Villas Affordable Housing Project. I think these 47, 48 units, uh, Mary Jane, you can correct me, uh, they, they are desperately needed housing. And with the rents that are subsidized, um, with the current market rents that are happening in Lincoln Heights right now, the, the, this is something that is very needed. We have so many friends uh, that are being pushed out of the city and we really need affordable housing uh, to provide opportunities for them to come back. And one of the things that, uh, that was mentioned was the, the, the parking situation. And I think these units would replace a parking lot that it sits pretty much vacant most of the day. And by providing housing at affordable rents to vulnerable community members, we really believe that this project will provide more valuable um, community support than the 
support that the current parking lot can provide. And so our city and community need more housing units, affordable units. And there's not a lot of that right now. And we need to have these units being built quickly. And this project has already been delayed for over four years. And we cannot wait any longer. We want our friends, we want our community members back in our Lincoln Heights community. So we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And this is a very good and needed project. So I call on the neighborhood council to support the project, to reconsider and support the project. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Next, we have Thomas Irwin. All right. <clears throat> I believe I am unmuted now. Um, yeah, so my name is Thomas Irwin. Um, I'm the director of community-focused work at New Life Church in Lincoln Heights. Um, I also run a small nonprofit focused on building economic opportunity. I also coach basketball at Lincoln High School and have for the last six seasons. Um, I also help found Eastside Housing for All because I've seen firsthand through my work at the church, through my work at the high school, um, how many residents of our community have been priced out. Um, the market rate rent um, for the type of units that Works is looking to build, uh, bring online here. Um, usually is at this point close to $2,500 to $3,000 a month and our residents just can't afford that. Um, so for that reason, I just want to reiterate that I strongly support this project. Um, I'm someone who's been uh, kind of researching, looking into this project since it was proposed five years ago. Um, I've gotten to know the work staff. Um, over the better part of that five years, um, really heard their kind of heart for the community, their desire to build deeply affordable units. Um, and again, we've seen in recent years, our church had to disperse tens of thousands of dollars during the pandemic just to try to keep the folks in our church and in our immediate church family in their homes during the pandemic, because those folks, if they were pushed out of their home, had no affordable options to go. And unless our city builds those desperately needed affordable units, we're gonna see folks in our community just slowly priced out, slowly moving to San Bernardino, Las Vegas, Arizona. Uh, and that sense of social ties, that sense of extended family and community uh, will be slowly destroyed. Um, and I think we can all agree on this call that that's a really bad thing. Uh, where we may apparently disagree is whether or not this specific project can help. Um, and to me, uh, bringing 48, units that are subsidized between 30 and 60% of those market rents um, is a home run, something that our community uh, should absolutely support. Um, as Veronica, the last caller mentions, um, I have personally been going by this uh, parking lot on Avenue 24 and just taking notes on how many cars are parked there. It's often in the single digits. There've been multiple times I've gone by on Sundays and there have been zero cars parked in the slot. Um, so the idea, I believe DOT found that max utilization was 40% of the spaces were taken up and that's during the day at, at kind of peak hours. Um, so we're not talking about a lot that by being replaced is gonna have a huge cost. There are plenty of parking spots in the other um, four lots that exist in Lincoln Heights for this specific project to be built and not impact local businesses. That's to say nothing of the people who would be joining the community and able to walk to those local businesses and patronize them. Um, so I was very disappointed to hear the neighborhood council oppose the project. I appreciate the service you all do, um, but I wanna invite you to reconsider, um, given that this project has been proposed, given that it would be a benefit to the community, um, I believe that supporting it is actually the best thing for the community. Um, and I wanna call on you to do that tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Next, we have Ray Don. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. I'm sorry. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, but I thought it was important to get on. Um, my name is Ray Don Tritis. I am a long term resident of Lincoln Heights. I grew up here, graduated from Lincoln Heights. My kids go to Lincoln High School. Um, I'm with the Coalition to Protect Lincoln Heights. And we've been on the five lots project since it started. Um, so one of the concerns and some of the things I hear is like, you know, our community needs to come in and we don't want to see our, fam our family members and community members leave. But I kind of feel like, you know, this is a lottery for the city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, meaning that 
it's not necessarily going to be New Life Church community members that would get in there. It's kind of like playing the lotto. You're, you're going through the whole county. And then second of all of this is that from what I understood originally, um, even though Works is putting their name on it, I know that their funds that they're going to build with has to be like a quilt where they're going to pick up other developers that might not align with what Works wants to do. And one of the major things that had happened last time was there was a very crooked developer known for being pretty shady, not following CEQA, um, out of out of the country developers that come in and kind of bully, like they use works as their face, but at the end of the day, money talks. So when those developers come in and they put the funds in there, is works gonna be able to provide the whole funds for this project and manage it all the way through and through with no discrepancies? That was something that was a little bit off the last time that we were, this project had come into play with and then lastly, you know, I know when these projects go up, they're not, act, I know we're saying they're going to be environmentally friendly and we're going to have these, you know, these great solar panels. But from what I know, they're not held to CEQA qualifications or the regulations that CEQA has. And that was something that's alarming. So it sounds good, but when we get down to the paperwork, we don't know if it's actually going to be good. So that were um, major concerns. And I, I get the new life hope positivity for this but at the end of the day if we're lucky there might be one or two Lincoln Heights residents most of them are going to be from all over the county thank you thank you Ray point Next. of order is there a time limit for each of these speakers um we really want to hear from the community on this one I think I'm going to table the rest of the items on the agenda so you know so we're just going to designate uh the rest of this meeting to this item Next, we have Stephanie. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Hi. Yes. Yeah, hi. My name's Stephanie. I'm calling as a concerns uh, community member. I've done graduate school projects on tenants' rights advocacies in Lincoln Heights. So this is one of the communities that I've carefully monitoring for what's going on in terms of displacement and other development projects that are happening. To kind of answer the per previous person before me, that's not how development with affordable housing works. They're not really allowed to stack funding like that unless you're partnering with another developer on a project from the outright. This, that's not how these projects are publicly funded. These are from local city, state and federal funds that are very carefully monitored. So if a project says that they're gonna go under, uh, what is it, solar panels and they include that in one of their funding applications, they have to provide solar panels as part of their funding commitment. Um, I understand the hesitancy with a lot of development that's coming in, but I think affordable housing is very nuanced and unfortunately it also gets kind of lumped in with what's happening with other market rate developments. Um, Works has a really long reputation in the community. They do really good work and I fully support this project and I would hope that the neighborhood council will see that this project is going to bring a very much needed um, building to a community that needs it. And I know it's really unfortunate that we can't set aside specific units for community members, but that would be unfair for the rest of the folks that are really needing to apply to these projects. I know local preference is really leaves a lot of folks out, right? But then there's folks in the community that would complain that it's like, well, we don't want certain folks from these communities coming into a lot of these spaces. And a lottery, unfortunately, is the most fairest way that you can try to like make things a little bit more equitable. And I know that's not a, that's not a perfect process, but it's currently the system that's been going on in development, affordable housing development for a really long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I don't see any hands raised in the public. I see one more, Pedro Ramirez. Pedro? Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to kind of echo upon uh, what the person before Stephanie said. I mean, if I remember correctly, this is one of Cedillo's pet projects. And... Um, We've seen this time and time again with these structures that keep getting built up. Um, they say that it's affordable housing, but is it affordable housing for like residents or people at the rate at which this community is making money? Or do they go by the low income threshold where it's like unfeasible for anybody in this community to even rent these like apartments? 
on top of that, the biggest no, the biggest reason why we shouldn't support this is simply for the fact that this is a lottery system, and we already know that regardless of whether the people go into the lottery or not, they're raffling off apartments that are going to be two thousand five hundred dollars a month. Our community can't afford this. We do not have a housing problem. We have a market problem. The greed of these developers driving up the prices of rents and mortgages that's what's killing our communities it's not the it's not the lack of housing it's the lack of affordable actual real housing the fucking prices on our rent are so high they continue to drive them higher and higher and that's what's destroying our communities it's not these lack of housing we have enough housing to house people we just don't have the power to stop the greed of developers and of landlords from driving up prices so I beg, I beg the council, please, please continue to work the way that you guys have been working. Oppose this project and oppose all of the projects that they're trying to shove down our throats on these five lots. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Pietro. And um, yeah, so, so commenters, yeah, can only comment once. So if there's any dupes, um, just uh, yeah, sorry. Noted. Thank you. Next, we have Mark Walker. Mark. Hi. Um, I am a youth pastor at New Life Community Church, uh, one of them, and I, you know, pick up teens in the community for our services and youth groups, meetings and conferences, and I just have been over the years seeing teens from the community, you know, having to move out to Verona, San Bernardino, and we lose relationship. And so just seeing that pattern in LA, I think we need more housing in LA. I agree with the statement made earlier that don't let the um, perfect be the enemy of the good, right? You know, that we just need to be building more. And so I think this is an opportunity that I would encourage the Lincoln Heights uh, Council to take advantage of, have more housing. So less of these teens and their families are having to leave the community. I think it's just a good for the community. So wanted to voice that, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next, we have Eric. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to let you know that I support uh, the cancellation of these and all the five locks projects until they're sorted out from the corruption of Cidio and crew. Uh, we need to restart and make sure that uh, we build a community free of corruption and free of developer greed. And this project very much does not seem like it uh, holds water. So I, I oppose uh, these and the five lots projects. Thank you, Eric. I don't see any other hands raised from the public. Um, do I have the opportunity to, to um, just clarify some things for some of the speakers or, or no? Yes. Yes, thank you. So um, I, I wanted to um, say to Pedro, I just wanted to, um, if I may share my screen again, show him the rents that are being proposed for this project. So um, all of the units will have one bedrooms at 1340, two bedrooms at 1608, three bedrooms at what, 1858. Some of them, as many as we can, will have one bedrooms at 670, two bedrooms at 804 and three bedrooms at 929. So they, they are really not at the higher levels that you're talking about. And our, our whole motivation as a developer is to provide affordable housing. Um, and, and we are required by our funding sources to keep these rents affordable at these levels for the entire uh, life cycle of the project. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Um, and as, uh, as, as Stephanie, I think it was said, I wanted to just respond to Ray Dawn to, to let you know, Ray, we, we are not able to bring, and we will not and would not bring in other developers at a later stage in the project. We do have a partner who, who has been our partner ever since we began this project. Um, that partner will be with us to complete the development of the project, but we will be the sole developer partner that manages the project going forward. Um, and all of the funding that we get comes from government sources and from conventional banks. So it's not from investors or you know anybody who has a who the the only people with a with a profit motive really in this are 
are the uh, the banks that we have to borrow money from in order to do construction. The rest, the city, the county, the the federal government and so on are not motivated by profit. They're motivated by making sure their money is well and efficiently used to accomplish the goal of providing affordable housing. So I just wanted to clarify that for you. Thank you. <clears throat> any board members have any questions or comments, please raise your hand. I'd like to make a motion. We have three hands up. We have to go to board member comments now, Ben, or don't we? Yeah. Okay. All right. We have Vincent. Thank you. So I'm just going to bring people up on a on a big history point that they often don't mention to a lot of people. This project has already been done with a 30 year covenant that they had, and that was a failure. We're coming up on those covenants now. And they're 100%, they can go full market and do what they want with them. Okay, that's been that's a huge problem. All they simply did was now add a 55 year covenant now. Okay, so they're just repeating this again. In 1959, our families that were up in the uh, Palo Verde La Loma Bishop, that's now Dodger Stadium, <coughs> we're going through this housing crisis. This has all been always induced to cause us to accept these projects because they don't come perfect and we know that, but they do come with corruption. They do come with backdoor deals and setups like we see here today. One of the reasons why I say that is this, this <laughs> five year covenant for housing, yet they're gonna have a 99 year lease on the land. Yeah, they'll never own the land, but what good is the land when you have that building on top and after 55 years, what will happen and why do you need a 99 year, 99 year covenant, right? A lot of times they go into that business side of it. And that's what I was waiting for because we didn't hear that in our uh, committee meeting. But when you also look at the affordability and they often say government sets the policies for affordability. Well, let me just bring our study up into the council. Um, what we found is that the 3% that the city right now allows for the raising of rents okay, is really a push out rate rent, right? It pushes you out because number one, your paychecks do not rise 3%. Your social security does not rise with 3%. None of this money rises with inflation. The city has failed continuously to address the affordability of housing, not one decade, for decades and decades and decades. That's why we're here, always on the back of the brown and black communities. That's why these housing projects are here. To, to have a lottery to say, we're just gonna open it up and this is a federal law and now we cannot promise you guys housing is no guarantee that anybody in our community will ever get anything out of it. As we have seen in other projects where the turnover rate is at least 80% of the people and it's higher in some other places that are not even from the communities anymore. And so we really even need to go into details on how that is managed because it is not managed correctly too because it's part of a city system. Just like the raising of the rent is not managed, nothing is managed in this situation. And that's why I question always, do I, am I aware that we need affordable housing? Do I look at those prices and know that some of them may be affordable? Of course. But what we can't do is sell our kids out in the future because this deal is a 99 year deal. Most of us will not be here anymore. And we have to be responsible and we have to learn from that 30 year deal originally that went in and all the problems it's bringing now. And we're, our backs are to the wall right now because now we're in a major, major housing crisis now. If we, were, if we weren't 20, 30, 40 years ago, we're gonna be in a major housing crisis 55 years from now. And that's why a lot of times these projects need to be pushed back, in my opinion, even though I know we need housing. But we also have to understand that game, that money game that's being played. This is wrong. You don't need a hundred, a, hundred, a 99 year lease for a 55 year project. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Next we have Jared. Yes, thank you. Um, I am by no means a housing expert. I'm, I'm learning as I go. Um, I was very interested in this issue of the proposed project not providing 
uh, preference to community who are at risk of displacement, any community member at risk of displacement and in need of affordable housing. Um, what I did see, and I guess this is a question for our presenter, um, is that on September 28th of this year of 2022, uh, Governor Newsom signed SB 649. Now my reading of it, and it's, it, is a, it is a complex statute, um, that there is a framework being put in place to provide for um, local, how, local, pre local preference. Um, and I'm wondering if our presenter can speak to that at all. Um, shall I respond? Yes, please. Yeah, I, this is, and this is an honest question. Um, do you know anything about this law and how it is? Uh, I, I, is, no. it, is it being is it being considered by the count? Is this what you were referring to, uh, the council um, considering? No, um, I I am actually not aware of that law. I would I will look at it up right away. But um, the what I'm referring to is that two city council members, I believe it was Blumenthal and De Leon. Um, uh, sent a request to the housing department to explore the possibility of getting a waiver from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the federal one, um, to allow for a local preference, for a, uh, a preference to accept local residents who qualify. Um, and that that is something that the housing department is currently exploring and that the city council could move forward as quickly as they wanted to, and um, uh, and and uh, again, I I would strongly suggest that this neighborhood council, which is for whom and and the community for whom this is an issue, would support such a request. Um, as I said, it's there's no guarantee as to how fast that would come, but it's possible if if the request were made now and with the our new mayor's connections to the Department of Housing and Urban Development that this might be able to move forward uh, relatively quickly. And in fact, it could move forward in time to be the law by the time that we are leasing up these units. It's gonna take us from today, um, let's see, I think we're talking about being occupied in 2027. So we have uh, um, about four and a half years before we would be fully occupied. So if this could go forward now, it could happen by the time that we're leasing up these units. I would love to be able to make them make a make a local preference um, possible for these units. Um, Thank you. And and just for my for my fellow board members and for any members of the community that are still listening, um, I I did the research you know as best I could, and it I I it it, it does appear that local preferences. Um, are illegal under federal law, under, under federal housing laws. And that's a fact. That is not something that our presenter is making up. Um, that is the state of the law. And I believe that's why SB 629, looking at the legislative history, why SB 629 was passed was to try to uh, remedy that for affordable housing. So there's that. And, and I think the hangup could be if it's preempted by federal housing law, which would have, have precedent over the state law, um, that might be something that's holding it up. I really don't know, but I would encourage our, the board, I would encourage the, the, the public, I would encourage certainly the members of the plan, planning and land use committee to take a look at SB 629, because there might be some um, action there that we can all take. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Next, we have Annalie. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering how much government funding uh, has been uh, allotted so far or, or where we can obtain that information. And then also, I know that everybody had spoke a lot about, um, you know, the amount of, uh, like about how the parking, the parking lot isn't being used and I think there's two things to think about with that, that there, you know, we've also said in this meeting that a lot of the businesses on Broadway are not actually functioning, which is a whole nother subject, but also what, um, you know, this project, like how many cars is this project going to end up bringing into the community? Because I know that anyways, that's the whole issue with other TOCs in the neighborhood. But yeah, about the funding, um, 
if you could answer that or where I could find that information. Sure, I'm happy to answer. Um, at the moment, the only committed funding we have is the city's agreement to lease the property at uh, for 99 years at a dollar a year. So that's an effective about two and a quarter million dollar donation to the project. We have just applied for funding from um, the city of Los Angeles. I think we've applied, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's just around $5 million. But we have to apply for further funding from the uh, state for this project. And then we have to apply for low income housing tax credits, which we will uh, um, syndicate to an investor. They will have no control over the project or the way it's built or anything. The only thing they get is the tax benefit. Um, and and so there's a lot left to be done. That's why it will take us until uh, roughly the beginning of 2027 to uh, lease up the project. Um, may, may I also just say one thing to, um, I think his name is Vincent. I really appreciate your concern for the future uh, and for what we're doing that will, will or will not benefit our kids. I care about that too. I'm a, a grandparent myself. Um, and uh, the, the fact that we have a 99 year lease, um, it's a 55 year, it's a 99 year lease with an initial 55 year period and four possible extensions of 11 years each. Anytime we extend that lease, we have to continue to abide by the affordability restrictions that are imposed by the city in the ground lease. So if, if we have the good fortune to be able to build this and maintain it for 99 years, it will have to be affordable for 99 years. And then at, at that point, the city would have the option of extending it if they wanted to continue to see that project operating as an affordable housing project or to have the building go back to the city. So there, there, it's not that we would have the land for 99 years and only operate it for 55 as affordable housing, no. As long as we continue to lease the property, the, the land from the city, it would have to be remain affordable housing. Does that make sense? Oh, I just wanted to, just one thing. The problem with that is that eventually you have raised the price with with all the standards and um, overhead that you guys have running it, right? 55 years from now, those prices are not gonna be the same that you have. Well, uh, certainly uh, you're right that um, rents will go up each year as permitted by the, as as permitted and restricted by the government. You, uh, you, you, uh, you certainly would recognize that operating costs go up every year, and we want to. We, we have to be able to maintain the buildings. You don't want buildings that can't be maintained because that's not good either. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so that's the reason that there is a, a permitted price increases, rent increases by the government. Uh, in order to make sure that the properties can be continued to be operated effectively. And just just one 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 point on that one. <laughs> like William Mead is true public housing. It's not the, the private partnership. They have maintained their rents without having very little minimum raises of their rents. That's very different from the private sector, which is the private partnerships that are with nonprofits. That's why sometimes if we if we really wanted to build housing, we should be building just regular public housing. We should not be doing private partnerships because there's an overhead cost. I'll even say this, some of the nonprofits that are paying themselves exorbitant amount of money, you may not make a profit off the initial service, but the amount of money that people are paying themselves in those nonprofits are just crazy and they're not regulated. And I think that's something we all take into effect. That's why I push, I push real public housing versus public private partnerships. We don't have to deal with all of that. And the test of time when they've tried to take these pieces of land have always ended up in court and litigation where the, 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 the end result is that the city cannot give it to a developer to develop. And right now they are pushing to do that. That has stood the test of time. And that's why it should stay that way because it stays within the public's hands and doesn't go into a private entity. Doesn't matter if the nonprofit feels that they're good or not. It matters that they are still a corporation of the state and there's very little to any interaction that they need to do into the public. It's all left up to them. 
where in a public agency, you are forced by law that you have to have a public records request. You have to follow those things. We lose those things in charter schools and in private partnerships. And these are things that are being put forth in litigation now in courts when people can't even go to the schools where their kids get public money and they can't because it's a charter school. So those things are very important to the future because I see them now and they're being a huge issue. Some that have been in existence for 10, 15 years in housing. Same projects that you guys are doing that had the 30 year uh, 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 sunset clause on it. So yeah, those we've, we've never developed any of those. That's not, that was before our time. <laughs> it's, a, it's just the same process. <laughs> I'm just saying no rules have changed differently other than the 55 year. I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to take too much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Melanie. Sorry, sorry, Fernie. Can you I have to try, plug my phone in. Can you come back to me? Not a problem. Next we have Sarah. Hi, hi. I just have a couple things I want to say. I'm on the pluck. I just want to um, just talk about these really quick. Um, Lincoln Heights cannot afford these units in, to begin with because we are extremely low income level of income. Family of one single person makes about $22,000 a year. That's below the threshold of these uh, units being low income, very low income. Um, also, I want to kind of speak about uh, the church saying, you know, some church members saying that they see these parking lots empty. Well, unfortunately, due to uh, 41.18, the city made it illegal for our local residents to shelter themselves from the elements and, um, yeah, uh, be on the streets in tents or anything. So those parking lots are now empty, but previously they had people in them unhoused trying to uh, survive. Um, also, uh, you know, we have Mission Villa uh, apartments, affordable apartments over there on Mission and, and Broadway. The Covenant is running out, and I think there's 500 units. Their rent was increased. How many units are there for you? Um, over 200, and their rent was increased over 500 per month. Yeah, so we have Mission Villa, and then we have Hillside Villa, right? So it's like, what do these hundreds of hundreds of tenants do when their rent gets doubled or whatever, increased? Well, do they shuffle on to the next affordable housing project, right? Um, also, uh, I have a, a, an issue with uh, this idea of filling quotas since this is a Cedillo kind of thing, right? These five lots. So five lots, it's not just this one, but the five, right? They have an exclusive contract. Well, it's like we have the Cornfield Arroyo specific plan on the other side of the freeway, which seems exclusively reserved for luxury condos. Is this filling a quota so then you know they can go ahead and do that business on the other side? Um, also, I want to talk about the units. So there's 21 one bedroom units, 15 two bedroom, and 12 three bedroom. Lincoln Heights is a neighborhood of families. Our average family size is 4.2 people. So we need uh, three bedroom units. Also, uh, Curious as to why it's the same architect as Avenue 34, KFA. And uh, I was over at Flores Del Val Apartments on Thanksgiving and I couldn't even figure out how, how to get in because it says, uh, do not trespass. I had to find an open door and uh, wow, the management of that building, um, there's issues there um, in the hallways and everything. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of residents there who get in contact with us uh, seeking uh, tenants' rights information. That's all I have to say. I'm sorry for taking everybody's time. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to go back to Melanie. Thank you. Hi, Mary Jane. Thanks for coming back and presenting to the council. Um, this was a really hard vote for me last time. Um, you know, because of everything having to do with getting a certain level of income people into our neighborhood or keeping them here. Um, but I, I have something I want to say, and then I have two questions. Um, and I, the one thing I want to say is that it concerns me that Gil is tied to five lots. 
Um, and it concerns me that there's the Avenue 34 um, tie-in as well. Uh, we all know Gil disgraced himself and refuses to leave his seat. And I, I think all the time, why? Why won't he just step down? He lost handedly to Unisys. Like it's time to, all I can think is that there are multiple probably developments in, you know, in the queue for him to ensure that like he keeps his pockets fat. And I, we have a vote of no confidence as him, as our council member. And I don't want him or any of his projects anywhere near our community. So that's something I just wanted to say. The two questions that I had, um, one, I noticed on one of the slides, which I didn't catch last time, and this really is what got me as a yes last time, was um, the units for the disabled community because there would be a potential for them being able to come from Lincoln Heights because they typically need to be close to their families. What yeah. I did notice on the slide this time is that um, it said, you know, 100% of units will be this, and then up to 49% of units may be available for the disabled community or survivors of, um, you know, domestic abuse. So I wanted to just question that language there because the maybe concerns me because those are what I would consider affordable units, um, which leads me to my next point. Looking, being able to like look at the numbers today because I took some screenshots of the slides. Um, I'm sure everyone will bring this up. Those don't look affordable to me those are units that like I could afford. And I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't need affordable housing. This is not coming out right. I hope you know what I mean, but like, that's just, that's too much. Also like what quanti what qualifies as a person? Um, five people, is that like five adult people working? Or is that like two people who are working in the household and three children? And like, how can two people make seven? Like, it, it just seems like a lot. It seems like a lot for affordable housing. Okay, so thanks. Um, shall I, may I may I answer? Mary Jane, I think you're muted. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, to answer your questions, um, and and thank you for your uh, questions. Um, the this project has nothing to do with the Avenue 34 development. I, I am not aware of what that is actually. And the fact that KFA is the architect for both of them is a, just because they do a lot of affordable housing work in general. So other, so many developers hire them. Um, <clears throat> this project, to, as far as I know, has no mechanism for getting any money into any pockets of any politician. Uh, we did not, um, provide, we, we have not provided payments to anybody to get this development. And it's, it's not a, um, that is not part of it. Um, so, and I understand your, your, your reluctance to, to continue with anything that Gil Cedillo was involved with. Um, we're, we, we ourselves are, are delighted to have, um, uh, the new council person coming in, um, uh, but I, I would have to say that some of Gil Cedillo's staff has been very helpful because they believe they have believed in affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the developmentally disabled, um, we would very much like to include those units for the developmentally disabled and for the those who are, are su survivors of domestic violence. It's a question of being able to get the funding that we're looking for and hoping for to be able to make that possible. Um, so uh, we will we will be trying as hard as we can to make that a, a possibility. I, I didn't quite understand um, your comment about the affordability. Are you saying that um, the the rents are not affordable? Yeah, and you know what? I'll just I'll, we can pass on that question because I'm sure it will be brought up by other members of the council. I know there's a lot of other hands raised. I did a terrible job of asking it, but thank you for answering my other question and my statement. Uh, thanks for your time, Mary Jane. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Next, we have Gil. Oh, good evening. Thank you for appearing, and I. Uh, on the surface, uh, uh, you seems like you've uh, addressed uh, some of the things like uh, the parking and everything else like that. But uh, I'd like I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to uh, voice uh, some of my 
opinions about uh, affordable housing in general construction. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we we should uh, we should get away from this type of uh, development, uh, like uh, uh, Vincent says, uh, partnerships and everything else like that. I happen to have 45 years construction management experience. Okay, I worked for two. Uh, uh, developers in San Pedro and Torrance, and I also uh, even built two tracks myself. Okay, so I know cost and everything else like that. And when it came out uh, uh, a while back, where these units are uh, five hundred thousand dollars a piece and everything else like that, everybody that I was associated with in the construction and energy all those years just blew it. I mean, they just. And then, of course, the, the uh, chairman of the, of the supervisors, county supervisors, says, we're through with that kind of stuff. We're going to go with private. So that, that's I'm making my plea, not in, in, the, in regards to this unit in, in its way through, but the fact that we have to rethink all this thing and, and uh, get it uh, so that we can build affordable housing, even less than the, uh, with all the incentives that you have. So uh, I'm just speaking from from personal experience of uh, building uh, all over the South Bay. And uh, I know it doesn't cost that much. And and uh, the companies I work for only had about three or four people in them, okay? You have an infrastructure that you have to support and everything else. So uh, there's a lot to be said if we go the direction of uh, private uh, development of, uh, and it could be affordable housing. Thank you. I, I um, Gil, I, I agree that I think there is a role for private developers, um, as long as the the government can assure that what they're they're getting what they want. Um, I also um, just like like you what the organizations you're talking about. We actually are a firm of only six people. When we have a development that needs, uh, you know, we we work with a lot of consultants and and. Um, and others who support the work we do. But our overhead is deliberately kept as low as possible. <laughs> Thank you, Gilbert and Mary. Um, next, we have Richard. Hello. Um, well. Richard, do you have a comment or question? Can you hear me? You have your hand. Me? We can hear you. There you go. Sorry about that. I was just gathering my thoughts too. Anyways, where is that? Ray Dawn is pretty cool. <laughs> And Richard, are you commenting right now? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, a bunch of parking issues because I know a bunch of people there and there's gonna be more, more units is gonna just spoil it for everybody else. And they're, they're gonna be businesses, right? You know what, I retract all this, I'm sorry. I'm confused here. Okay. Well, I think Richard's trying to ask because the store, the first level has uh, non profit storefronts, correct? Um, no. No? Does not have storefronts. It has a community room that okay. fronts on the street, <clears throat> which, is, which is primarily for the use of the residents themselves. Thank you. I'm going to go, go next. Um, Mary, thank you for being here and for your presentation and for the time. This is a second meeting now. Um, I have three points to make. Um, I do just want to remind the board of the tenants that presented to us over the summer from Mission Villa Apartments. Um, these are tenants that come from also subsidized affordable units. However, their covenants expired and all of their rents were raised over $500 a month. And every sort of outlet that they looked for for help, it was just, they were all just turned down. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, and so I do think that the expiring covenants is a very insidious way to get um, development into our communities. 
Um, and I want to touch back on what Melanie pointed out about the affordability. Um, I saw that a three bedroom apartment is $1,800. And I think about all of the tenants in Lincoln Heights that are currently in subsidized affordable housing and know that a three bedroom apartment is nowhere near that price. And all of those tenants would be just like houseless if that's what the, if that's what the price was for a three bedroom apartment. So I'm wondering if the second portion of that document that has a three bedroom apartment set to about $900, why not just make all the units that bracket income? Um, and then the last section, going back to the meeting we had with planning and land use, um, public housing was brought up and you said something that I really liked, Mary. Um, you brought up that uh, your organization would be more than happy to hand over the project to a community land trust, should there be one. Um, and I think that's an awesome thing. Um, I do want to ask if you're authorized to make those kinds of decisions on behalf of your board um, to us during a presentation like this. Um, that's all I have. Unmute. Okay. Um, I, I, I was saying that because I believe that community land trusts are a good thing. I would not be authorized either by the city or by the um, or, or by the city who, who is providing the ground, ground lease or by the funding agencies for building the housing without getting their permission first to do something like that. Um, my board is very much in favor of affordable housing that will be available uh, permanently for the long term. So I have no doubt that if there were a viable, good opportunity to do something like that, that is something they would be very interested in considering. But no, you're right. I cannot make a commitment here today and say we would do something without getting permission, uh, both from the city and the lenders, as well as from my board. <clears throat> I didn't mean to give that impression, I'm so. Thank you, Mary. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, that being the case, I would like to make a motion. What's your, please present. Ben, what's your motion? I move that we uh, accept or support the decision of the pluck to oppose the project. Um, the purpose of having committees is so that we don't have multiple hour discussions on the major board, that the uh, committees are designed to, to clear that up and make the decisions of. Um, we have a decision of the committee to reject this. I move that we uh, support that decision. Okay, we have a second. Richard seconds. <clears throat> Any more board member discussion on this motion? Any public discussion on the, on the motion? Raise your hand and press star nine. Public? Okay, we have a panel stand up. We have Sylvia. Hi. Um, I've been taking notes on what all of the speakers on your end have been chatting about. So sorry, I have kind of like a list to go through very quickly. It'll be quick. But um, starting with uh, I, a lot of my board members on this committee have mentioned that the parking lot uh, in that situation. I just want to echo that, that it has not actually been empty most of the time. There was one member who mentioned he comes by sometime, drives by sometime. Um, I walk my dog there almost every day. And I can assure you that it's not always empty. It's not only, um, it's not empty on Sundays. It definitely is not. And uh, if there is any reason for why we now have less traffic in there or less cars in there, I want to remind us all that we've been through a pandemic. Many businesses have been shut down. There's been less, there's been more street parking because there's been less businesses as well. So I wanna reiterate that. I understand that there's people who come by and maybe see the space sometimes, but as somebody who walks by there almost every day with their dog, I can assure you that's not the case. Um, that's one thing I wanted to mention. Um, also echoing off of Sarah's comment is that the family size is not reflectable with this community or even nearby communities in case it does go to a pool, which it looks like it will, and it has to be going through a pool. 
um, the family size is not reflective of what the communities around here need. It's more reflective of what a student would need or a professional person that comes from outside would come in need of, a one bedroom, a two bedroom maybe. Um, and in addition to all of this, um, I think one of the things that concerns me the most is um, intention. And when I see that several community members are coming from the point of uh, New Life Community Church, who is my backyard neighbor, and who are very much on the, um, um, of the opinion that this is community-based, community, community-based. I wanna remind us all that as my backyard neighbor, as someone that I walk around the corner with and I see them every single day, this is a church, a tax exempt organization that was not open to the community even when we were in our most dire need. So for it to now come to us and echo sentiments of something that is a monetary need is very suspicious to me. And I would like a more holistic approach to this where it also incorporates not just our community and takes into account the people that live here and that park here, but also our undocumented neighbors because I heard no, um, no, uh, of all the board members and all of the um, members on your end that discuss the need for or the um, the emphasis of um, the benefits that this would do to our community, there was no mention of the undocumented population and how it would support them. That's my time. Thank you, Sylvia. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. Any other board member discussion? I don't see any hands raised. I'm gonna move forward with a vote. Motion is to oppose the project as presented. Um, a yes vote is to oppose it. A no vote is to not oppose it. I'm gonna start with Sarah. Yes. Ben. Ben Wadsworth. Yes. Chente. Yes. Fernanda is a yes. Nancy is excused. Benny? Yes. Annalie? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Didia? Yes. Jared? No. Gil? Yes. <laughs> Richard? Simone? Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Estrella? Yes. That's 14 yes, one no. Motion carries. The motion carries. Thank you, Mary Jane, for presenting today. <laughs> really appreciate it. All right. Thank you for your time. Bye. All right, thank you. I want to thank the public. I want to thank the community for coming out too and um, for the Q and A and everything. Um, so the uh, rest of the agenda, we are going to continue it to the next meeting. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to item, I guess, number ten. Vince. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. A second. I'll second. A second. <laughs> okay. Don't everybody hesitate. All those yeah. opposed, I don't hear no opposition. All abstentions, I don't hear any. Meeting officially ends at 9 15. Thank you, everybody. Good night, Good night everybody. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.